introduce ourselves. Well, I'm, I'm Todd Scott, and I'm the current Executive Director of Global Supply Chain for General Motors. And I want to welcome everybody to the best case competition and the best case ever here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Bob Monska, Professor Emeritus, Michigan State University, Supply Chain Management, and it's uh, very much a pleasure to continue uh, participating and helping in development of the best case competition worldwide. Hi everybody, I'm uh, Dave Drulard. I'm the Executive Director for Purchasing a Global Propulsion Systems. Uh, essentially what that is, that's the Engine Transmission and Electrification Division of General Motors. Um, I want to say this is my fifth or sixth year as a finals judge, and I will say it's one of the things I look forward to every year. So it's really exciting for me to be here. Thank you very much. Hi, Bill Rolls, I know I had a chance to meet you earlier, and uh, I've been here every year, so it was kind of fun seeing the competition. and and seeing the progression of, of both the quality of the presentations but the competitiveness of the schools. I know this afternoon is going to be a very, very fun and very, very challenging time. And, and we really welcome all of you and congratulate you. And we congratulate all of you that, that have participated. So let's go. Okay. Can we start? Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. We are Team FGP, composed by Samira, Giovanna, Cesar, our professor Alexandre, and me, Pedro Weiner. We are also commonly known as the Brazilian GPSC team. Uh, well, we couldn't think of a better way to start this presentation than beginning at the end. So, all comparables considered, we have achieved a total savings level of $71.8 million. To arrive at this uh, substantial result, we have attained ourselves to several key factors that we consider crucial to our analysis. Namely, we have prioritized the most expressive costs and used the Six Sigma Core 2 DMAKE to reduce them substantially. Moreover, for any scenario, we have analyzed all costs involved directly and indirectly. Also, we were always aligned with GM GPSC strategy, uh, fostering to maintain a strong relationship with our key partner, SCUBI. Moreover, on the directed by front, our recommendations provide uh, relevant savings and do not have virtually any delay trade offs. In the material indexing, we were backed with a specialist made, uh, forecast made by specialists, and we had a consistent approach for reducing uncertainties in this way. And last but not least, as any decision, ours have risks, but we do believe they are manageable, and we have worked hard to keep them like that. So on the DMAKE methodology workflow, we are currently at the MI step, where we need to identify and study some potential opportunities for cost reductions uh, that we will present to you on this target. So here is the process overview of how our group have deployed this analyze step. It started with identifying OPEX opportunities for cost reductions, which can be dismembered into two possibilities. First, possibilities regarding to GM scope of choice. For those, we needed to prioritize them in terms of uh, costs to know which part are the key parts to impact. Also, our partners could be made some proposals regarding to the plant's capacity allocation and JIT opportunities, as we will explain further. For those possibilities, we have approached them using a holistic view, making use of some tools such as detailed cost analysis and a time analysis for that. Also, we have analyzed all the risk concern and the strategic alignment of those possibilities. Concomitantly with all of this, we have brought up also some suggestions for improvements and after all of the previous assessments were duly made, we arrived at the total savings I presented on the first slide. We'll uh, present that to you on the toge, and once approved, we can go on on how to implement those solutions. So about the first kind of GM possibility and how we prioritize them. Here is a Pareto analysis of the seed cost breakdown. And as you can perceive, material is by far the most representative cost of seed. So if we deep dive on the material cost breakdown, here you can see that all the costs are fairly representative to the total material cost, and therefore we needed to virtually attack them all. We used two tools to attack them. In the columns in black, uh, we attack them using uh, directed buy opportunities, and on the columns in green, we use material indexing contracts. But what is material indexing? It, this is a kind of pricing contract widely used all around the world. As a matter of fact, according to a Deloitte monitor, in the US only, it's used for more than $100 billion in terms of products, and it's usually used to index prices of, uh, of products that have a high stake of their cost related to raw materials and commodities such as, in our case, steel and leather. Uh, so what are some of the macro factors that can or cannot back our decision of indexing prices? 
Here we have plotted uh, flat steel historical prices from four different countries. And as you can see, commodities and volatility are words that walk together. And moreover, um, commodities prices are highly impacted by exogenous factors that we don't have control, such as political turmoils and supply disruptions. This year only we had some examples of that, about the tariffs brought in the US by US session uh, 232. And also this is happening now to the steel hubs of China, of the cities of Tangshan and Limpen, um, where there is happening some capacity curbs due to environmental concerns. Now my colleague Giovanna will explain a bit about the quantitative part of material indexing. So as we know, our chief economist has provided a two-year forecast and we need a five-year forecast. And as Pedro uh, said before, we have gathered information from different experts such as J.P. Morgan, Consensus Economics and Focus Economics that are specialized, uh, specialized consultant firms to have an aggregate forecast. But as we know, uh, we, are, uh, we always have a forecast accuracy risk and we combine three main elements to mitigate it. So we use an independent forecast from different experts. So, for instance, uh, we have access to an analyst uh, from JP Morgan Metals and Mining Research Team uh, in order to have their perspectives about the next two years in the steel industry. Uh, also, we weighted by probability uh, considering the historical level of accuracy of each source. Uh, uh, lastly, we use a polynomial interpolation in order to have the gaps between the known data points uh, uh, since we need a monthly forecast for our decision. Uh, for steel, uh, we have decided that material indexing is the best option since it leads to us a total savings of 17.3 million dollars in a horizon of five years. So for leather, we had a big challenge. Uh, we, uh, leather is not a widely traded commodity and there are no future contracts in the market for it. So we made several studies uh, in order to uh, gather all this information and we, and we discovered that leather has a high correlation prices with uh, beef and slaughter cattle. So we use uh, this forecast in order to have an accurate forecast for leather prices. So we use the data from J uh, USDA, OECD and also World Bank to have an aggregate forecast. And the U uh, we use uh, the same methodology as well. So in this case, we also uh, decided for material index because it would bring to us a total savings of $29.8 million and a horizon of five years. So, uh, we have the first situation with steel and leather, but uh, should we stop at the given options of material indexing? Uh, our team believes that the answer is no, because we found another widely traded commodity in the wire harness that is copper. So. We use the same methodology with data from JP Morgan, uh, Consensus Economics and Focus Economics to have an aggregate forecast. And we decided to also make the material mixing contract um, because it would bring to us a total savings of $5.5 million in a horizon of five years. So gathering all this information, uh, we have total savings of uh, almost $53 million in a horizon of five years. So now, Sandra will explain about another work stream that, are, that is directed by. So now, analyzing and assessing directed by opportunities. Uh, the main objective of this tool is to provide cost savings, so that is our main and principal analysis. But in the specific case, there are two other very critical factors to consider. First is timing, and let's keep in mind here that we're talking about the launching of trucks. So every tool in time associated with uh, associating for adapting the directed by suppliers production line can have and will have a huge impact on the launching and launching delays of our product. Uh, also we have considered some strategical factors such as the relationship with Scooby, our tier one supplier, and uh, specific factors of each of our directed by suppliers. Uh, making bringing this information all together we come to our joint analysis uh, to find uh, the final choice for each piece part. So now, let's briefly assess our cost analysis, and uh, we were given the option not to be directed by it all, so as three different codes for each part. And here, uh, that enabled us to calculate the, the total unitary costs, and they are all highlighted, the, the total, uh, the minimum costs, but we, we wanted to have an idea of the potential that directed by can have in savings. Uh, for that operation, so we analyze those along the life cycle, and as can we see, we can arrive at up to 37 million in savings uh, using directed buy. But no, we do not think that a decision like this can be made by only looking at costs. 
In fact, we, re we think that represents uh, such a gas myopia. Because uh, there are so many integrated and strategic factors that we have to consider. So let's start with our main uh, part, as Pedro told, and this is our first joint analysis. So looking at our joint analysis, our clear option to go was Chomps, New York. But we have a clear problem. Uh, sticking to them would mean that we would launch our delay in 36 weeks, and we do not think that this is acceptable by any means. So we came up with a mitigation strategy. So uh, we're issuing a one-year-only contract with Tito Korea in direct buy. Uh, we do know that there is a higher unitary cost, but uh, again, our priority no launching delays, and for the rest of the years, we're given sufficient time to chance to adapt our production line, and then we came with a low total unitary cost. Analyzing this strategy uh, along the five-year life cycle, we have 6.3 million in savings and no delays, so we're very happy about uh, that savings. Uh, now moving to airbag, uh, at first uh, it, would, it would seem that the most logical opportunity would be to go with AXL, but as we know, Scuby has a deep and profound relationship with Shiba, such as joint ventures and exclusivity contracts. And when making this type of decision, we do think that's very important and we cannot break this type of relation. So uh, our decision was to stick to the base case. But uh, we weren't satisfied by complying with the case restrictions, so we found some cost reduction opportunities. And it's not in logistics, not in tooling, but it's in component costs. We went even further and went into the level of the subparts of the airbag and discovered a very interesting thing. Uh, there are two subparts, inflator and OPW, that represent 64% of the airbag cost, so it's very representative. And currently, Shiva is paying 37% more than its main competitor for, for, for them. So here we have a huge uh, purchase, uh, purchasing price opportunity. Uh, if they can manage to, to reduce these purchasing prices, they can be as competitive or even more competitive in pricing they had AXL. That analysis is not uh, in, into our savings, but uh, we do think that's a huge opportunity. Uh, for Bracket, Tony, our, our current supplier just came with this innovative and technological idea of 3D printing, and we think that is the best of both, both worlds. It provides higher bracket quality with lower cost. But the problem is they only have one machine right now, so even though that would be sufficient not to uh, provide any delays in the launching, uh, we have to analyze in the initial period week to week to see if, there, if we wouldn't have any backlog or inventory shortage in the initial period, because the validation of the further machines are very complex and take some time. So uh, if we would follow the JIT strategy, we would have a huge backlog of 1.6 million cars, and again, we do not think that that's acceptable by any means, so we came up and have went even further with three mitigation strategies. All of them include starting the production now of brackets and stocking them uh, in order for the launch. We do know that there is an inventory cost, but it's very manageable. Again, this is only for the initial period, and the backlog is re re dramatically in reduced in this case. So as doing extra hours, then the backlog is further reduced. But the optimal decision, and we do not know if that's totally possible due to uh, case information, would be anticipated in six weeks, the two weeks should now already planned in GM, so then we would completely eliminate the backlog. Uh, now moving to the switches, um, we decided to go with chomps and again uh, concentrate, and we decided to concentrate all the volume bought from this company via directed buy. And here they provide a higher cost, but uh, we, we, we propose using the GM's purchasing power because they, we uh, have contracts with them for two more pieces, so we're using this purchasing power to make them match the, pra the price that they were uh, charging for scubbies. Um, for directed by MSM, uh, for the next ones, they are pretty straightforward. We do not have so many trade-offs, so I'm going to go quickly through them. So directed by MSM, wire harnesses, Figo Honduras, and here we do not have many cost, uh, op cost savings opportunities, so we stick into the base case. So now let's do a final wrap up of the directed by. Uh, we had a nominal savings of $37 million, and in our real savings we arrived at $17.7 million. But only at this time, first, we have low and virtually no delays, and if we have them, we mitigated them all. All the strategical factors are considered, and more important than that, we preserve and maintain Scurvy's key relationships, which we think that's our priority in this type of analysis. 
Now Samira will explain a little bit more about Scurvy's proposals. So in support of the uh, siege reduction cost OPEX, Scurvy provided us with some, oper some uh, proposals for plant location and GIT. So the first scenario is the point is our point of record, which is producing everything in Colombia and then sending to Fort Wayne. For the the first alternative is it is to produce everything in Lordstown and then sequencing all the production in Colombia. For the second alternative, we would we would produce everything in Lordstown but using a third part sequencer uh, located in Yoder. And for the alternative three, we would uh, produce one mod, one truck model in Lordstown and other two models in Colombia, and uh, where everything would be sequenced. So, uh, in order to take a decision, we first made a cost, we did a cost analysis, and focusing on these three parameters, uh, we we have investment and labor and sequencing costs, but. These numbers are not yet comparable because we have to include the third part sequencer cost. So here if we see in the investment, the investment gets much higher for this option. But they are as they are really specialized on this, uh, they are they provide us with the lowest cost in labor and sequencing cost. So then looking to the logistics, especially on transportation, alternative one has the highest cost. And it's because of the long distances that has to be traveled. And it also uh, impacts in the inventory cost. And here, the highlight goes to the safety inventory because all the products that are not made during the broadcast window has to be stocked for two days. So this is why this uh, inventory cost is so high compared to, the, to our point of record. And now looking into pallets and trailers that we would need to transport everything, uh, we stick to the worst case scenario, which is to consider uh, the highest uh, transit time for each trip and the, uh, the maximum daily demand. So those are the figures we have. Putting all this together, we see that alternatives 2 and 3 seems to be the best in terms of cost. But as this difference isn't really, um, they are not really different, so we proceeded with our risk analysis. We took into consideration two supply chain factors, the probability of a lack of technology or lack of capacity, and uh, if our decision could uh, result in a in relationship issue. Then, to quantify it, we plotted a probability and impact matrix for each option. So, for our point of record, the highlight goes to the fact that the Columbia plant is an old plant and it's operating in almost full capacity. Uh, for the alternative one, the long distances, they increase the chance of disruption, but it, it's also mitigated that everything is being produced in a modern plant. Uh, for alternative two, uh, and making a contract with a third party supplier may increase, uh, may mean a threat to a GM's scope relationship as we are taking this from them. And for alternative three, we have that the, uh, dividing the production into two different plants may, uh, may be really complex, may uh, increase the complexity of sequencing everything. So uh, alternatives one and two seems to be the best options in terms of risk. When we look into the risk and cost matrix, uh, alternative two uh, is the best option for GM to go and that's our recommendation. And uh, so we know that there is a relationship risk, so we elaborated some recommendations to mitigate it. So we uh, would recommend them to prioritize, prioritize Scuds' large town plan from now uh, for future development and to stimulate them to build a new pl sequencing plant so they could put this inside of their operations again. So now, uh, Pedro, will talk to you about the point of Rafa. So, uh, having all the previous assessments duly finished, we can arrive to each tool, total savings per set in the first line, and total savings in the aggregate. So, summing all that up, we arrive at an aggregated savings per set of $27.4 per set, uh, which uh, mounts up to almost 3% of savings per seat. That, for the, our total project's life cycle, will account to the $71.8 million of savings. 
Now we'd like to conclude uh, offering you a view of the strategical benefits that our project can offer. So first, uh, we can offer a very consistent cost reduction on an especially tight situation uh, in terms of debt possibilities. Moreover, we believe that if we keep prices fixed, <coughs> this uh, suppliers tend to overprice their um, their products that have a high stake of raw materials on it, and that can, uh, in order to hedge against volatility, and that can lead them to the wrong impression that they ha have a very not tight margin, and this can uh, lead them to hide some operation, operational inefficiencies and bring them to a comfort zone. And therefore, we think that indexing prices can mitigate this situation. Moreover, our options on material indexing offer more transparency towards the relation between uh, supplier and GM. Also, all of our opportunities have virtually no impact on timing and all the, the production will be delivered in the due time. Also, all of our directed buy decisions uh, mainly prioritize GM and cost reductions, but however, we have decided also to preserve our partners' main interests of that. So on this front, we kind of chose the best of both worlds in every of our choices. And last but not least, we believe that a new reality is coming. So impacted by uh, customers' new preferences and behaviors, uh, in the automotive sector, new technologies are coming fast, such as uh, electric cars and driverless cars. Now, we know that GM is already a key player in this sector, so we believe that some of our choices, such as choosing the 3D printing for producing brackets and moving the production to Lordstown factory, which is a high-tech factory, are highly, highly al and aligned with this um, environment. Um, but our project doesn't end here. Today, we have received the breaking news that a criminal hacker group have hacked in, auto, in our MSN supplier systems. So here's how we're going to solve that. First, uh, we need to know that all of our decisions here will be highly aligned to GPSC strategy still, with core values such as quality and safety, uh, compliance and, transpar and transparency, and keeping a strong relationship with our partners <coughs> and trying not to damage them. So here is our order of prioritization of these facts. First, we believe it's absolutely vital to keep our customers' integrity and uh, do not deliver any card from them that can threaten them, uh, their security anyhow. This was, uh, this was crucial in all of our analysis and first order priority. Second, we need to be transparent and uh, let all of our major stakeholders know what's going on and what is, G and what is GM making to solve this problem. Third, we try to minimize delays and lastly, we try, of course, to minimize the cost impact of the situation. So we first needed to trace an immediate plan, which included a communication plan and other actions that my colleagues will explain a bit further to you. So about the communications plan, we first, of course, need to communicate the regulatory organs so they can take the necessary measures to mitigate the situation and, of course, try to find the criminals. Also, uh, we needed to communicate our customers through social media, which we saw here that is a main um, concern to GM, and let them know what is going on and how are we going to mitigate this. Also, we needed to keep our major stockholders informed through the investor relations uh, department, and last but not least, inform all the speciali uh, specialized media channels about uh, the current situation now. So when it comes to action, we know that they have to you have, would have to recall all the vehicles because uh, quality is the main value for GM. So we know that there is various costs, costs involved on it, but we didn't have enough information to calculate them. But we, uh, we listed some of them, which is backlog, logistics, handling, uh, the loss and new components, and the sales impact that uh, it would make cost <coughs> for GM. And then we decided to change the supplier. So why we did it? Because we have absolutely no certainty about when these problems could be solved. And that's why we are changing and how uh, we chose which one uh, would be our new supplier. First, we looked just into the minimum tooling time. We think that any delay would be a disaster, so mitigating it would be the best option. And then, uh, we know that during this uh, 14 weeks uh, tooling time, three weeks would be a uh, shutdown, uh, would, uh, GMs would have a shutdown in those plants, so uh, we have a minimized impact on this. 
So the supplier we chose is Fido Korea. It's also good to know that they already uh, supply wire harnesses for us and in the, as Cesar previously mentioned, uh, they, uh, they provided the first year of the motor part of the car. So uh, we already have a relationship with them and that's a good thing. And also they are financially stable, which is good to know that they probably can handle this. So, as we know, uh, we had three last weeks of a lot of parts that we bought with chomps uh, and we need to remake the, them because they are affected by the problem. So, we have an additional cost of almost six million dollars. Also, we have the tooling cost that in the worst case scenario, uh, we need uh, almost a one and a half million dollars to move this tooling cost for the part of Indo Korea. But we, uh, we identified the opportunity to negotiate this uh, transferring uh, to the cost uh, that may bring to us a cost savings and to, uh, to be a two week time shorter, that is a critical factor for us right now. Uh, in the first scenario, that is the perfect scenario for us, we uh, went to ch uh, chunks and we would have uh, two and a half million dollars of savings. But now, uh, with Fido Korea, for Korea, we match the base case cost, so we don't have savings, savings anymore, but we have a mitigation for it for now. So, uh, so now, uh, looking at all the situation impact on the total plan, we had previously $70.1 million uh, in aggregate total savings, and we could account for costs that were uh, possible to calculate in the case, $7.0 million. That leaves us with a remaining savings in $64.3 million, and we know there are various costs that we cannot account, but uh, these savings are available to support an, account an accountable cost, such as handling, such as recalls, such as logistics, uh, all those things that we cannot um, account. So, um, as for long-term thinking of GM, uh, we think that uh, GM has to have a better, a even more supplier selectivity when it comes to digital security. We know that digital is coming very fast and uh, that can happen again, so we have to be prepared. And we have to promote the use of technological pro protection measures and be uh, always one step ahead of competition. So we got to be the leader when it comes to that, so it does not, that does not happen again. And of course, we know that problems always can happen, and when they happen, we gotta keep GM, GPSC strategic values in mind. So, like, we are a big company, and we cannot let um, cost interfere in our image, in our values, in the way customers perceive our brand and, and their confidence. So, especially quality and safety are our main priorities in all those type of decisions. Uh, so now, uh, concluding everything, uh, we have kept to our main priorities. Uh, we provided a safety and quality in the first place because we need to be uh, aware of that. That's our main part of the issue. But uh, we were transparent with our customers. We let them know what was going on and how we would solve that. And with all our stakeholders, uh, we had <coughs> minimized delays. Uh, that was our best case scenario, and we're very happy about that. And. Of course, we had some costs, but we, we think that our uh, final um, proposal is profitable in terms of costs. Now, uh, we thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to answering all your questions. Thank you very much. <coughs>
case overview. The case is centered around the light duty T1 Chevy Silverado and the GMC Sierra trucks. The T1 OPEX project focuses on cost reduction by working with suppliers for direct buys, determining material indexing, cost effectiveness, and identifying the best alternative sequencing opportunities while mitigating risk. I'll hand it over to Jake to go into our solution. Thank you, Bert. All right, so uh, first component for the solution was material indexing. We had to come up with a solution for steel and leather. First, we picked steel. So a uh, little bit of background. There was indexing, and then there was the current cost, cost structure. Um, for steel, it was gadget and belt die casting. What we did was we took the indexing, we converted it to pounds, we then quantified that material cost, then we compared it, and then we evaluated and to see which was better, the current cost structure or the indexing. From there, we decided that GM should engage in the material indexing contract. One of the reasons for this was cost savings. We got about a 43% cost savings per component. Another piece of that was transparency. When we made that decision, you can go to the upper management and then you can tell them, hey, this is why the price increased, this is why the price decreased, and then you'll have the solid market index to back you up on that. Leverage. GM is actually the only um, customer for Gidget and Bell at the Saltillo plant, and that kind of puts us in a good position for leverage to get a favorable contract. And then lastly, the price is still partly fixed. So with that being said, we do get the indexing kind of benefit, but we also have that fixed part to kind of cushion. Um, going down the chart here, so 43% per component, the two big numbers on those um, two graphs are 20,000 and 15,000 for the front and bench, what we currently pay. Up in the top there, you'll see 15,000 and 12,000. That's if we switch to market index, and that's um, the amount that we will pay. Over here's the map. There's where Gidget is, and um, next to right next to Salau there. We're hoping that that kind of helps customer relationships. That'll reduce lead times and uh, just kind of help bring them closer together. Over here, we've got the two bar graphs. The bars represent the current cost, and the line represents the indexing rate. And as you can see, indexing is cheaper. Next, we had to decide on leather. So it's kind of the same idea as we did for the steel. Quantified the material cost, we compared them to the current cost structure, and then we had to evaluate and assess which is the best to go with. The result of this was that we believe that um, GM, again, should go with the um, indexing for leather. Uh, again, kind of same reasons as before, cost savings. There's about a 12% per component cost savings. There's transparency. Uh, again, you can talk to top management, and you can tell them, maybe this is why it went up, this is why it went down, and you're going to be able to track and kind of gives you a little bit better idea of where the market's going to be going. And then again, reduces volatility due to the fixed pricing aspect of it a little bit, but still you get that cushion. Uh, you have about a 12% uh, cost savings per component. Over here on these graphs, you've got the 34,000 and the 41,000 are the original that you would have. And then up in the corners, you'll have the 31,000 you will be spending now, and then the 37,000 you will be spending now, if you choose to index. Uh, this one's actually closer to the Fort Wayne plant, so that we're hoping that that kind of helps with that customer relationship. And then again, on these two graphs, the bars are the current cost, and the indexing is the line. And now I'm going to hand it over to Mariah to go over the alternatives. Alright, so here's the alternatives. First, I just wanted to break it down for you guys and tell you how we got the total program cost. So first, we had to look at the capital expenditures, so the facilities cost, the tooling cost, the pallet, and trailer cost. And then you had to add on to that the shipping costs, and so we figured out per year, multiplied by five for the total length of the program. Then again, we had to find the piece and sequencing costs. Again, that's per year times five for the length of the program. Add it all together, and you get the total program cost. So plan of record, this is what we currently are doing. So right now we are actually sequencing and assembling in SCUBI at Columbia City, and we're shipping it just in time to Fort Wayne. And obviously we do not need any more trailers or pallets because this is what we are currently doing. Now for the cost analysis. So the 90 million is the Scooby piece cost, and the 9 million is the shipping cost, 6.5 million is the capital expenditures, rounded it out to be 105.7 million. 
Now the alternative. So alternative one would be where we would make all of our seeds in Lordstown and ship it to Columbia City to be sequenced. And we would have, then we would send from Scooby to Fort Wayne just in time, just as a plan of record. And then you're gonna, we found we needed 16 trailers to buy and 1,038 pallets just to support this program. So the total cost for this was 142.8 million. Alternative two is a little bit different. We're still gonna be assembling um, seats in Lordstown, but it's gonna be 50%, or no, I'm just kidding, it's not gonna be 50%. It's all of the seats, and they're gonna be sequenced to DWL, which is actually Scooby's 3PL um, sequencer. So then from there, you're gonna send it to Fort Wayne just in time. And we need 14 trailers and then 100, or 948 pallets to buy just to support the program. And now this total cost analysis is a little bit different because we had to include the DWL sequencing cost. So and it rounded up to be 136.5 million. Alternative three, this is where it gets different. So this is where we have 50% of the seeds being made in Lordstown, shipped to Scooby where the rest of the seeds will be made, and then shipped to Fort Wayne to be um, assembled into the trucks. So for this we found there were six trailers and 379 pallets. And the total cost for this was 121.2 million. Now we weren't quite satisfied with those cost savings, so we decided to come up with our own alternative. And we decided we wanted to make 17% of the seats in Lordstown, which is the workshop seats, and we would send them to Columbia City to be sequenced, where the rest of the 83% of the seats would be made, and then shipped to Fort Wayne just in time. And for this we found we needed five trailer and 156 pallets to support the program. Total cost for this was 105.3 million, so it was the cheapest. I just wanted to break down just how we found the, pal the pallet and trailer cost for you guys. So here's the plated record alternative one, two, three, and four, and then on the bottom is the total cap X cost for these. Now for our decision. So we obviously went with decision four, alternative four, because it did save us some money and it saved us $380,000. It also was going to position us for future growth because we think our T1 trucks are going to do amazing in the market. We're going to need to buy, we're going to need more capacity and our current plan, we're running out of capacity, so we need more. And the, our solution alternative four does that. <coughs> it's also going to lower the capacity because as you can see, the work truck has the least amount of parts. And so it, we have a less complex seat being made further away, so it just makes it easier for us. And like I said, 17% of the seats are going to be made in Lordstown and the rest are going to be made in Columbia City. Now I just wanted to show you kind of how the alternatives stacked up against each other. So as you can see, our alternative four is the cheapest option. Now I'm going to hand it over to John for the direct advice. Thanks, Brian. So we use this purchase, purchasing strategy here to kind of guide us through all our decision making for the direct advice. First, what we wanted to do is we wanted to minimize our logistics costs to increase profitability. There's a tightening logistics market in the U.S. and we need to keep those costs low. We also want to shorten our lead time to allow for great, greater flexibility. Our customers want different colors, they want different options, and they want different trims. And being flexible and being able to get those parts to our sequencer on time is critical. We also want to eliminate redundant, redundant shipping routes with round trip logistics. So what you'll see here later on in our solution is we've got a lot of parts going between the Mexico and the U.S. and the, mid -rep, in the, med, in the Midwest region. So it's critical that we're getting those cost savings with round trip logistics. And finally, we want to avoid political instability and future tariffs. So, to start uh, with this solution, what we did is we mapped out our plant locations. As you can see, a lot of the suppliers are located in North America. We've got a few in Asia, and then we've also got one in Europe. Then, what we did is we took the production schedule, we broke it down by market penetration options. So we looked at the high volume, high value, and the work truck. And then, what we did is we looked at the part usage map, figured out how many parts are in each truck, found the total number of parts for the program, Multiply that by the price per part and the logistics cost per part to get our total program cost. So starting with the motor, we selected Chomps Automotive Supply at a program volume of 5.3 million. As you can see here in the top left hand corner, the total program cost. Chomps is our chief set 623 million, that's significantly less than Fido Korea, who was our incumbent supplier. In the middle, you can see our tooling timing. Chomps came in at 61 weeks. And then uh, as you can see here on the bottom, we have our price per part that includes the logistics as well. Uh, one on the left is for the U.S. and the one in the middle is Mexico. Finally, in the bottom right hand corner, uh, Chomps is conveniently located in New York, so that's close to our Fort Wayne assembly and fairly close to the Salado assembly, so we're not shipping over the ocean, we're keeping those lead times short, we're keeping our logistics costs low. 
Next, the air bed. We want AXL safety solutions for a program volume of 6.4 million. In the top left hand corner, you can see AXL at a total program cost of 263 million. That was significantly less than Shiba, which came at uh, 276 for a direct device. So that's about a $15 million difference. Tooling timing for weeks was 46 for AXL, so it was the longest. And you can see the price for parts. And finally, AXL was conveniently located in Arizona, so that's about halfway between Fort Wayne and Salau. So we're getting those short lead times, keeping our logistics costs low, and then we're responsive to any threats in the market. Our switch low, we went with Chomps Automotive Supply. Program volume was 3.2 million. Chomps was not our lowest cost supplier here. They were actually about middle of the road. So we, the direct buy from Chomps was 17.1 million. Our lowest cost was uh, SPH, which came in at 16.1 million. But the reason we went with Chomps over SPH is because SPH was formerly Woodstock Auto, and they went into bankruptcy, bankruptcy recently. And the reason we didn't go with them is because if they're uh, going into bankruptcy, they're short on cash. That means they're not investing in their facilities, and they're not investing in new products, which is not who we want to select as a strategic supplier. As you can see, Chomps Auto had a 16-week tooling time. You can also see the price per part for U.S. and Mexico. And once again, Chomps is conveniently located in New York. With Switch Low, we also kept that with Chomps. It'll be uh, 3.2 million for the program volume. Once again, Chomps is not our lowest uh, lowest cost supplier here, but we're getting that high quality, and we're avoiding SPH, who's a, a much riskier supplier. And, and the difference in the cost there is only a million dollars. And once you can, as you can see again, Chomps is conveniently located in New York. The switch high, uh, Chomps, it's uh, 16.7 uh, million. Uh, and then the lowest cost supplier here was 15.6 uh, 15 for Astro China. Once again, we didn't go with China because uh, there was a long lead time over the ocean, so you're going to be about 30 days uh, to get those parts over the ocean. We, we were worried that they'd become obsolete if we were shipping those across. Um, and then once again, as you can see, Chomps is conveniently located in, in the US. The module. We went with uh, Chomps on Motor Supply for this one. Program volume was 5.3 million. Chomps was our lowest lowest cost supply here at 201.1 million, just a little bit lower than SPH. As you can see, the total the total tooling timing for Chomps was 28 weeks, and you can see the location there as well. The wiring harness. We went with Astro Dynamics for the wiring harness. Program volume was 6.4 million. Uh, as you can see here, Astro Dynamics directed by was 215 million, which was not our low cost supplier. Fido Honduras was the uh, lowest cost supplier at 211 million. Fido Honduras recently lost their quality, cer quality certification in relation to waste. Uh, so if they've got a lot of waste in their process, that means we're, we're throwing a lot of stuff away, they're increasing the costs, and we're doing a lot of rework. That's also not uh, delivering on GM's commitment to zero emissions because then we're emitting more in the environment. So that's why we went with Astro Mexico. And as you can see here, Astro is conveniently located in northern Mexico, close to Salao Assembly, and also fairly close to Fort Wayne, too. So we've got short lead time and low logistics, and low logistics costs. The seat heater, we went with Astro Dynamics. Program volume is 5.3 million. Astro was not our low cost supplier, they came in at 147.5 uh, million. Balto EU was our uh, lowest cost supplier with 147.3 million. The reason we didn't go with Balto is because they're not a lean manufacturing environment, and then they're also a lot farther away across the, the Atlantic Ocean over in Europe. So we didn't want those long lead times, and then we also didn't want that uh, we didn't want that supplier that wasn't a lean manufacturing environment. Settings are not innovating, they're not uh, streamlining their processes, and that's something that's not something we want as General Motors. And you can see Astro is right in between Fort Wayne and Salo. Finally, the bracket. So the bracket gave us some trouble, right? Uh, the selection we went with was Coney Hybrid, and I'll kind of explain that here. So we ran into bracket constraint because the 3D printers weren't going to be validated in time. So what we're going to do is we're going to tool up the original design at a cost of $445,000. Also, we're going to tool up the, the new 3D printers at a cost of $10,000. Now, the cost per printer is going to be covered by sheep. Uh, it'll be covered by Coney, uh, so we're not going to have to pay for that. So what we're going to do is we're going to supply Salau assembly for, through week 103. That's going to be May 20th, 2019. We're going to supply Fort Wayne through week 155. That's May 18th, 2020. Now, the reason we switched over uh, Salau first to the 3D model was because there were significantly, there was significantly longer or significantly more logistics costs if, when we're shipping parts down to Mexico. So if we're getting that lighter part and we're shipping it down there, it's a lot cheaper than uh, shipping that heavy metal part down there, which is why we switched them over first to get that cost savings. Now, we also had a capacity constraint of 93 printers. So the original quote they gave us of 250 printers was not enough. 
to meet our program volume for Salau and Fort Wayne. So what we're going to do here is we're going to purchase an additional 100 printers to bring our printer fleet to 350. And we got 10 extra there in case any of them need to be maintenance or, or breakdown. So back to the graphs. As you can see, Coney Hybrid, the program volume was 16.06 million, so that's our largest uh, volume part. That's why it's critical that we get a low cost on this. Uh, as you can see on the graph, Coney Hybrid was our, our selection at 154.7 million. Coney 3D, which is if we only use the 3D printers, that'd be cheaper at 154 million, but remember that program is not viable because the printers won't be validated in time. And then the original uh, from last year's model was 157.7 million. So we're getting about $3 million cost savings there, which is fantastic. The tooling timing for that uh, for the 3D hybrid will be about 155 weeks. And as you can see, Coney Technologies is conveniently located right by Fort Wayne Assembly, so we're getting just in time there. And we're not going over the ocean to get it to Salah Assembly, so that's great as well. Here's our direct buy cost savings. On the right-hand side, you can see the total, $30.2 million with our sourcing decisions. The airbag, the motor, and the module uh, were a large portion of that, and we actually lost money on the switch high doing the direct buy there, but I'll explain why we did that in a second. So the first 61 weeks, obviously some of the parts, some of the suppliers aren't going to be ready for that start of regular production. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the seats from the K2 program. We're going to build about 3,400 T1 trucks at Fort Wayne with those old K2 seats because they've got the same connection points as the new ones do. That's going to cost us 2.7 million. We're also going to build about 50 trucks at Salau Assembly at a cost of 40,000. So what we're doing here is we're spending that 2.7 million on those on those older seats, but that's going to result in a 30.2 million dollar cost savings down the road. Here you can see the suppliers that we selected. It's all right. It's all right by the. Uh, it's right by the assembly plants, and so we're not getting long lead time. So if our demand changes, if the high, the high value truck is, you know, our customers want that to the high volume, we can easily shift that. And we also got uh, a milk run potential here too, because we've got AXL, Astro, and Digit Bell. So we can send trucks to all three of those suppliers before they get to slow. So we're not sending empty truck or partially filled trucks to the assembly plant. One thing we also noticed was a lot of suppliers were located in southwest and Mexico region and a lot of suppliers were located up in the Midwest. So what we're going to do is we're going to develop a strategic partnership with our third party logistics provider. That way we're not sending empty trucks back and forth. So we're, we're sending parts down and then we're sending parts back up in those trucks to minimize our costs. So our, our round trip logistics, our logistics program costs $25.6 million uh, for logistics for, this, uh, for our directed buys. All parts are sourced from Mexico or the United States. We're going to negotiate the round-trip logistic pricing with carriers, and if, once we do that, we can see a potential for a 10% cost reduction, which, which would result in $2.5 million cost savings. Now we're going to, go to hand it over to Vernon to look at the market forces. Thank you, John. So the geopolitical risks we face are instability within North America, the Chinese government trying to take control of the shipping lanes and the South China Sea, and the Trump administration tariff policy that takes place in 2018. We avoid the, our strategy avoids these issues because all of our suppliers and assembly plants are located within North America and we do not have any overseas. Logistics market, um, due to recent mergers and acquisitions within the maritime industry, there is a potential for cost increases. Gas prices are rising above $80 a barrel, and we are experiencing a shortage of drivers. Because all of our suppliers and assembly plants are located within North America, relatively close to each other, we minimize the cap, we minimize the price of gas and the amount of drivers needed, utilizing our round trip logistics. And the tariffs between countries, we minimize that price because we do not have suppliers overseas. We only have suppliers within the United States and Mexico. Our market competitors, are in this competitive industry, the Chevy Silverado stacks up against the Ford F-150 and the Dodge Ram 1500. It is important that we keep the cost, we minimize the cost for our T1 OPEX program so that we can strengthen and maintain our competitive market position. And now I'll hand it over to John for or Mariah for our tool solution. Thank you. All right, so here's just the overview of the twist. So the plant manager at Scooby was informed that there was an, a breach in their security and the memory seat module was infected. So this, they also, upon 
investigation, they found that the shipment records were deleted and untraceable, and they found that part of the serial numbers had been corrupted, and they also believed that three weeks of the finished goods could be affected. So, and we also decided we're not paying a ransom because we're not going to set this kind of precedent. So looking at the twist map, we, select, we sourced the module from Chomps, New York because we wanted those uh, low lead times. And the reason we did this was exactly for the twist, right? We ran into a problem, um, and we're, we're flexible because if, if those parts were coming over in containers from China or from Korea, that's 30 days of inventory that's coming across the ocean plus what's, what they're making in their facility. So the reason why we went to Chomps in the first place was to mitigate a risk such as this situation. Looking at the twist solution, so we're not switching suppliers, we're going to stick with chunks. We, we strategically selected them and we're going to stand by them. And the reason why we're not switching to another supplier is because the tooling timing is so long. I believe it's uh, 14 weeks and uh, 28 weeks for the other suppliers. But we're also, what we're going to do is we're going to run the diagnostics on the parts made by chunks because we're making, we're making the module there, but we're also making both switches and we're making the motor with chunks. So it's critical that we make sure that the other parts that we source from them are not affected as well and then uh, we're going to ensure that the software was not breached. So we found that there was defective vehicles. So first we were going to identify and cross-reference the VINs based off of the production schedules that GM has that were not corrupted. And then we're going to find the VINs and put them on hold and route them to an intermediate dealer to actually disable the module and then we'll send it out to the dealers because we feel that, okay, so the seat module, it's just it's not going to affect safety because it's just memorizing the seat placement. So like, I'm really short, so I would have my seat closed. John would have his seat really far back. So that's how it goes. That's how the seat works. So we thought that wasn't really, you can still move your seat. You'll be fine. You just have to do it manually. You can't rely on a button. And then we're going to also offer a complimentary repair in one month to resolve that issue. So we're going to ramp up our truck, our work truck production for four weeks starting April 1st. And we're going to get 27,000 trucks for both the U.S. and Mexico. And then this gives us 20 weeks of finished good inventory of work trucks while we're figuring out and fixing our problem for the module. And then April 29th, we're going to ramp up our high volume to 60% and our um, high value trucks to 40% to then replace the trucks that were defective. And then we're also going to resume regular production after the 20 weeks because our issue will be solved. Long term, we're going to ensure that our suppliers upgrade their cybersecurity. We're going to make sure that they back up their proprietary information and systems on internal hard drives because we don't want something like this happening again. And we're also going to evaluate other suppliers to have as a contingency plan in case something like this did happen again. So looking at the dashboard here, our total cost uh, impact is going to be $5.4 million. So basically all the modules that we're going to have to replace equals that cost. Now what we're going to do is we're going to pass that on to Chomps Automotive because that's their problem. Uh, we're not going to eat that up. And then, as you can see, the modules affected in Mexico were 66.5K and the modules affected in the U.S. were 68.7. Now that includes the inventory that's already at Scooby and that also includes the defective vehicles that are already en route to the dealership. So I'm going to switch it over to John for the action plan. So here's our action plan. We're going to negotiate material indexing contracts for our seat frames and covers. We're going to contract uh, Scooby Lordstown to build, build those work truck seats. So remember, we're only building 17% of the seats <coughs> in Scooby Lordstown. A lot less complex seats, so that's going to enable us to be flexible in case of market demand shift. And we're initiating direct advice from all, all parts from our selected suppliers. So that will result in a significant cost savings. We're going to negotiate strategic lo logistics partnership with our 3PL to achieve those round trip logistics savings. So we're not sending empty trucks to and from the suppliers. Finally, that will result in a total cost savings of $31 million over the course of the program. So here you can see a picture of us. Uh, three guys are on our knees and Mariah is standing up. <laughs> really? <laughs> I think get them on my level. <laughs> so thank you very much for listening to us today. So I'm totally understanding exactly what you're doing, so I'll make sure. So we decided that we were going to ramp up our, up our production of the work trucks so that we could have those work trucks available because after those 20 weeks we're not going to make any more work trucks. We're going to focus just on our high value and our high volume to, to set that back up once our modules are fixed. Okay, and so that production represents 20 weeks worth of, four weeks worth of production, that's what you're saying? And then you wouldn't have any more production until sometime would, oh, April 29th. April 29th. Oh, that's what I missed. That's okay. when we would so you think you'd have the problem solved, your assumption here is you'd have the problem solved in about a month's time, yes. working with a current supplier and all their expertise, 
uh, together with us. Okay, just want to clarify that. Two questions. Uh, one has to do with the uh, issue related to the future. What kind of requirements are you going to place on purchasing and cross-functional teams in terms of future supplier selection related cyber threats? So as you can see here, where are we at here? So long term, we want to ensure that our suppliers upgrade their cybersecurity, right? That's critical. Um, that's, that's an issue that's plaguing a lot of companies. Um, so we can set up, as General Motors, we can set up a cross-functional team to work with our, work with our suppliers. Um, remember, we're saving $30.2 million on this program, so we've got significant room in the budget to be able to do that. And I don't think that's going to be a problem to put a cross-functional team together of IT folks who can work with, work with our suppliers and ensure they've got the correct firewalls in place to make sure this doesn't happen again. Okay, the reason I ask the question is just that as you go forward time, there's undoubtedly going to be greater emphasis on cyber threats, which means that formalized efforts are going to have to be put in place and people are, quote, educated about what is going to have to be done within the supplier community. Hey, my other comment is more a comment than a question. Thanks for a great job. Thank Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I have uh, any questions, but just some comments. Um, you know, what I liked about the presentation, I think you addressed some things that, that are real and that we talk about every day. I think your comments about logistics and the challenges that we have are right on. Um, the company, uh, is an SPH. I look at them as a private equity company, right? We are very apprehensive of private equity. I thought that was spot on. Uh, Bob's comment about cybersecurity, that's something that we are working with internally every day, so I thought that was really good. Um, I would similar to Todd where I wanted you to restate your analysis in regards to the remix, so thank you for that. And uh, congratulations, just a very nice job. A couple of comments, and again, I'll reiterate a couple of things I saw. One is I liked your slides, how for your cost strategies, how you, you really use the different quadrants to outline the different elements of, of the decision, the volume, the tooling cost, et cetera. That's a complex question you're answering in a sourcing decision, and your ability to simplify that information was, was excellent. It was very easy for us to understand a lot of variables that come into play, and you make a recommendation. So, I compliment you on the, the template you used throughout there. Uh, you had one slide there where you had a comment at the very bottom about logistics costs. So you saw a 10% savings. Can you try to bring that slide back up and, and explain what that was? I, I, I didn't catch how you were going to get that 10%. So, we'll bring it back even one more. So as you can see in North America, we're sending a ton of parts between US and Mexico. So all the parts uh, for that specific part is coming from the, the one supplier, and that supplier is either located in the Midwest or it's located in, in Mexico there or the Southwest US. So because we've got so much volume going back and forth between the two areas, we feel that if we negotiated a strategic partnership with one of our third party logistics providers, we lock all that volume in, that's guaranteed business for them. We feel that it would be reasonable to achieve a 10% cost savings through that program. Okay, so by bundling all of that work, you felt there was, there was potential. And that's, that's realistic, that's good. Uh, the other part that I really liked in your presentation about the breach is you going back and looking at the other parts that CHOMPS made. You, you had two discrete actions you took. One was specifically looking at the other products they produced which was an excellent step, because you just don't know, right? This was a hack, you know? But there's higher probability that they may have influenced something, along with looking at your, your total cybersecurity. So that was, a, that was a really good catch. Uh, so with that, I really compliment you. Uh, great job. Thank you. Yeah. And if you guys come up with any other questions, we do have in the booklets, we have all of our graphs and tables, so you can really see how we went through and solved the problem. Great. Very good. Thank you. Very good. Nice job. Mexico are all developing nations, and Mexico has a risk of cargo theft.
Slovenia, while it is a smaller country, it is developed, and we only source one part from them. We've also discovered no other abnormal risks with this location. The suppliers that are based in the United States are going to have less risk on average. However, there is going to be some risk during the winter with our supplier in New York when they're shipping to our uh, production in Mexico. With all of our uh, variables, any of them that are above a 10, we're going to need approval for a contingency plan in order to mitigate these risks. I'll now hand it over to Matt so he can walk us through material indexing decisions. Our team looked into indexing the market for two raw materials that go into the Scooby Team 1 seats. Uh, that would be steel and leather, of course. Uh, so we took uh, past market data and uh, GM forecast data and tried to indicate if there was any trend in the market. Um, as you can see here for steel, uh, we have a clear upward trend. I'm going to show you how that affects our cost analysis. We had a quote uh, from our supplier for 75 cents uh, per pound of steel. Uh, General Motors forecast uh, predicts over the next year on average for the cost to be 54 cents uh, per pound, uh, which would leave General Motors at a cost savings of 22 cents per pound. Uh, if we projected our uh, trend into the first year of production for the T1 project, uh, General Motors would realize a savings of roughly $2 million. So our analysis was the same for leather. Uh, as you can see, there's a low R squared value. Um, so we actually just took the average of uh, the General Motors forecast. Um, and the data, anyways, seems to fluctuate around the average. Uh, so uh, suppliers submitted a quote $4.50 per square foot. Um, the General Motors, um, the average was $4.59 cents per square foot, and on average it's going to put us at a loss of about nine cents. Um, again, if we carried this over to the first year of production for the T1 project, uh, we would realize a loss of $1 million, so obviously not a good decision. Uh, Terrence will now run you through the risk of indexing the markets. So whenever we're making forecasts, we're going to incur some risk. Fluctuations in the markets of uh, steel and leather are going to affect our earnings. For instance, with the steel market, we are indexing this. And there could be a sharp increase in the market value due to increased demand, decreased supply, or tariffs. There's also, or with the leather, it tends to fluctuate around the average. However, the supply and demand are always going to have an effect on the commodity price. Another risk that we're going to have to incur is uh, opting out of our supplier's futures rates. If we do this, there the market rate and the new rate that our suppliers are willing to provide us may not be favorable towards General Motors. Again, any of the risks that we have above a 10 are going to need approval for a contingency plan and in order to mitigate the risks. And I'll hand it back to Matt so he can walk you through the Scooby proposals. So Scooby Automotive sent our team uh, three various proposals. Um, here you can see is a cost analysis for all three proposals in the plan of record. Uh, in Alternative 2, it's clearly a little bit cheaper than Alternative 3. However, uh, it's important to note there's a risk involved with Alternative 2. Uh, Dino Warehousing Logistics has no experience sequencing seats, therefore they have no processes in place or infrastructure. Uh, so there's definitely a steep learning curve there. Uh, another, a benefit of Alternative 3, uh, which is the alternative we chose, is um, there is a potential for a decreased lane rate. So in this scenario, um, General Motors is expected to uh, contract the freight um, to the facilities, uh, and that's where we found some savings. So this is our lane rate sensitivity analysis. Um, uh, we expect General Motors to get a minimum of 1.5% uh, less than Scooby was able to. Uh, and with this 1.5% decrease, um, we're looking at a life cycle savings of $700,000. And with this $700,000, uh, this makes Alternative 3 the cheapest uh, alternative that Scooby sent us. Uh, compared to the plan of record, we're looking at a savings of $4.16 million. So 67% of our cost comes from labor and sequencing, and 24% of our cost comes from transportation. Uh, we found the easiest way to realize additional cost savings in the future is by working with Scooby uh, to create process improvement plans uh, that focus in these two areas. Uh, Terry will now walk you through the risks of uh, choosing Alternative 3. So as you know, we chose Alternative 3. The greatest risk with this one is going to be the lane rate. If General Motors is not able to get a lower lane rate, this option will not be the cheapest by cost alone. There is also the risk that we're going to incur with uh, Scooby sequencing. They are experienced at sequencing their own internal production, however, they are not experienced at sequencing inbound deliveries that we would be receiving from Lordstown. 
The, another risk that we're going to incur here is that we're going to be sending pieces to two different manufacturing plants. However, this could also be an advantage if we need to send pieces from one to the other quickly. So as you can see, this is why we chose alternative three. I'll now hand it over to Paula so she can walk you through our decisions, or our grant Thank you, Darren. Well, we have here the cost savings for each individual plan. I'm sure you're wondering what the total numbers are. All right, as I said before, um, the grand total is 37.5 million, and this comes from 35, 32 million, material indexing, 2 million, and scoobies proposals, 3.5 million. Remember, this is subject to negotiation, especially the lane right, lane rate. All right, now we're going to start with the tweets of scenario. So fast forward to April 1st, uh, 2019, uh, we have under uncovered that there is a huge problem with our member seat module. Um, our supplier, or our tier two supplier was uh, infiltrated by a group of hackers. Uh, their protection schedules are off. Uh, the memory seat modules themselves are useless to uh, customers, which is a huge issue. First thing our team did was we identified how many trucks were affected. So of the high value uh, trucks, there were 11,552 trucks affected and high volume 17,502. So Scooby, our supplier, has said that they believe three weeks of uh, production was affected um, uh, in, in terms of seats. So 70,000, or these are actually member seat modules. So this is a count of affected member seat modules. 70,007, uh, leaving out as a, co a, a loss cost of $2.6 million. Um, and then there was also uh, uh, inventory issues uh, at Scooby. So over two weeks, um, the production schedule at our tier two supplier was um, kind of messed up, and they, they ended up sending 30% extra inventory. Um, and so there's currently near 15,000 of these memory seat modules sitting at Scooby. Um, that's a loss cost of $556,000. Um, and then our total uh, bad <coughs> memory seat modules, 84,906, uh, a loss of $3.2 million. <coughs> So we also looked at the number of back orders this is going to cost, and we found that for the high value, it's going to cost around 61,845 back orders, and for the high volume, 93,705. This is because we estimated, uh, made an assumption about how long it's going to take to get our tooling, because obviously our tooling is messed up now, and we have to buy new tooling. So we made an assumption that we're going to use the supplier Snoopy Holdings, and their tooling timing is around 32 weeks, but we estimated that we get expedited down to around 16 weeks. And this shows the, the analysis, another analysis we did. Snoopy Holdings, the price is around seven cents more per unit. And if we only, so our, our plan here is to only produce work trucks at um, our, GMC, our GM facilities for 16 weeks, the total amount of time it's going to take us to get memory seat modules, since the work truck doesn't take memory seat modules. And if we did that, if we produced only work trucks until we got our tooling, um, we wouldn't need to make work trucks for another 75 weeks after that. So that's where we're looking. For our short-term plan, it's first and foremost to inform the FBI and maintain Confidentiality. We don't want this news getting out anywhere. We need to figure out what is going on exactly and what we're going to do about it first. Then we need to quarantine this memory seat module inventory immediately and stop production. And we need to let our suppliers uh, as well, our memory seat module supplier in this case, which is Chomps, uh, know about this issue. Then we need to contact Fort Wayne, Columbia City, and Lordstown and our logistics companies because we have freight that's inbound to our dealers and this is sure is going to affect um, our other GM facilities, we're using the same supplier for the memory seat modules. So we considered Fort Wayne and uh, Salau. So then we need to select a new supplier immediately because we got to get more memory seat models, models in, right? So we, we chose Snoopy Holdings because they're in Ohio um, and we wanted to benchmark the tooling time of Fido, uh, of Fido um, Korea. Korea. Yeah, Korea. Korea, Korea. Yeah. Um, for their tooling time and use that as leverage to get, make sure Snoopy Holdings can uh, expedite their tooling time to around 16 weeks. 
Then we need to adjust our production schedules because it's going to screw up um, what we had planned for our high volume, high volume trucks. Our plan uh, that we looked at was only producing the work trucks. And then we obviously are going to need to talk with the suppliers about room reports for the memory seat modules to try to get some pieces out of them because they're not going to be scrapped. There are some uh, components in the memory seat module that we can save. For a long term, Paul is going to let us know. Yeah. For the long term, um, set communication policy. Um, our suppliers were expected to advise if we, we work with an enterprise like SAP, we will. Um, get aware with the system telling us that it's a 30% more inventory volume. So we expect that our suppliers are someone that is looking at those numbers every day, aware of others, and um, talk about, about these, um, these questions. Um, the second is that suppliers' policies for backup records. So we want everyone to have um, backup records in separated and isolated um, <coughs> sites. Um, then it's a, upgrade our control, on the, oh, I'm sorry, upgrade the quality control systems in general. And then hire white hot hikers. We find out that that's um, is like a fake <coughs> hiking system that we hire. So they will um, revise what kind of gaps do we have in our system. And then what we could do to prevent those. And then it's upgrade security policies. So in general, um, our, our employees, we training for um, different um, privacy protocols that we need to follow. As an example, just don't open um, your email from your home computers and things like that, because that's where um, the hackers could get into our system. So this concludes our presentation for today. Uh, now we would like the panel to ask some questions. Thank you. One comment and then a question. I really, I really liked. Uh, I thought that was a really, uh, that was really cool that you did that. Can you talk about your decision to resource the business to Snoopy? Um, resource the business. Uh, well, can you repeat the question? To you're going to change suppliers if I'm not oh, yeah, yeah. mistaken. Yes, Snoopy Holdings for the. Yeah. Uh, you want to take this? Yeah, go ahead. So that's that is a temporary fix. Um, if our current supplier cannot produce a quality product in the near future, uh, then we will need to stick with that supplier. Um, or what we could do is we could split production 50-50 in case one or the other has any uh, issues in the, in the future. That way all of our eggs are not in one basket. Um, because those electrical components, if they do not function, it's very hard to get somebody else to produce those for us. Okay, great. Thanks for the clarification. Thanks. Uh, good job. Uh, a couple of questions. Could you go back to your slide on the switches? Sure. Like slide 23 or so? 21? And, and while you're bringing it up, uh, that, was the, that was the choice you had to make between the Chinese supplier and the, uh, uh, the current supplier. And the reason you decided to stay with the current supplier, I believe, was just the risk of logistics. Yeah, I think that's, and there, you there you go, right there. So, so you gave up a couple million dollars of savings there. You know, what, how could you mitigate that? That's, that's potentially a lot of money to give up because there is, there is a risk of, of transportation delay, but in some cases I look at a switch, I'm gonna assume it's not a really high technical switch, not maybe a high inventory value. How could you maybe mitigate that? Because we do bring a lot of, I would say, lower cost parts from other parts of the world, knowing, acknowledging you've got logistics <coughs> there. Well, we were uh, also concerned about material obsolescence due to our lead time, engineering design changes, so that was another concern. And then uh, political and regulatory costs. But um, for how we could uh, mitigate the risk of of the sourcing components. So we actually have them on a bunch of uh, direct buy contracts. Mm -hmm. um, so we feel like the amount of volume could potentially negotiate a lower uh, cost. Okay. That's good. That's always a challenge, you know, because right. you don't want to ignore because because your supplier is a long ways away that that you not 
that you just push them away because of that. Because you are looking for the lowest cost solution, right? And I like, I really liked how you used the risk matrix to go back to each decision, you know, and kind of evaluate. That, that was a real nice use of that tool. And I, and I saw you use that consistently through there. In your twist, where you're going to run the work trucks, was your plan to run, basically run the plants full and only make work trucks during that period of time? Yeah, it's a, it's a scenario that we looked at. It's just an idea that we're throwing forward. Yeah. Um, it's not set in stone at this point, but as analysis we made to see, uh, we need to check the inventory carrying costs of what a work truck, uh, holding all these work trucks would cost and see if it would be the best way to move forward, but it's the first plan that came to mind. We also had to weigh that with the risk of potentially shutting down plants and losing employees okay. and look at the yeah. cost. So we figured that problem. would be a bigger weight. Okay. And the, the other, any other risk that you see in, in adopting that strategy that you got to think about? Yeah, because these, uh, these cars are not going to get to the customers and they're going to be sitting in inventory and then you always have the risk of quality defects and scrapping all these trucks, uh, certain parts of these trucks. What else do you have there? The safety for the customer. We're the ones who deliver seats that are not in the right condition for them. Okay, thank you. Quick question about uh, volumes. You put up a number of, a uh, couple of slides with a lot of numbers about truck production components, etc. I wasn't sure I understood those. Okay. If you can put them up, because it suggests to me Point that there is a very significant volume yes. that is going to be lost based upon your. Is that for the twist? For the twist. Yes. Excuse me. <coughs> Well, yeah, that was based off the assumption of a 16-week lead time for the tooling. That was a very conservative guess. We, I mean, we're, we're pretty positive that we'll be able to get the tooling a lot faster than that, but we That's stayed fine. extremely conservative. Um, I think it's the next slide. Next slide. Yeah, yeah. No, next slide. Sure. And some of those, you keep yeah, adding them up, and they get very large. No, it's less. And, the, and the, question, the question really revolves around those volumes. And those volumes no, are, are true and real. Yeah given their assumptions. Then, did you give any additional thought to the immediate actions you could take to fix so you don't lose all the revenue that's coming from your high profit margin products? Because it could be significant at those numbers. Okay. So we did look at that. We looked at um, maybe producing the seat without a memory seat module for the time being and then issuing a recall. <coughs> However, uh, it's important for us to deliver a quality product to the customer. We don't want to damage any customer view of General Motors. So we can still put out production of uh, six, 16 weeks of production for the work truck and then we can rapidly catch back up by not having to produce the work truck in the following weeks. Does that answer your question? And if I could just add to that, one thing we also looked at was actually producing high volume, high value work trucks, but not putting the seats in them. But we don't know of the process to uh, store these cars and uh, move them around the plant when there's no seats in them. It seems like it's kind of a safety concern. Mm -hmm. So that's another idea we're looking at. Let's continue to produce the vehicles without the seats inside of them. And so your assumption is the MSM is very complex and difficult to replace in a seat assembly? Uh, not necessarily. Um, if it's if it's attached to the seat, I would, or like in within the seat, I would say yes. So that was our assumption that it was it okay. built into that's the seat. So if it wasn't, then that's a different that's a different conversation. Okay. And just to comment about the risk matrix, I think it's a very useful tool. There's one other step that you could do and put some numbers around it. But what you did is excellent. And putting numbers forces again people to rationalize exactly what we're facing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'll just go back to the point Bob was making. I mean, you have to make some assumption about how long it's going to take before you get to the final solution, right? So in, in that way, it's almost unfair because you have to kind of give a give a range of, of how long you think it's going to take. So in your case, you you you, you land on 75 weeks of production inventory of, of, a, of a low running truck, and that's probably something we wouldn't do to that extent. But remixing is definitely something. It's one of the very first things we would look to do. So. I thought that was good. I really liked all your graphics, the way the star came up on the, uh, the one that you had chosen. I thought that was, that was really good. Your risk mitigation uh, uh, matrices were, were excellent. I, I think I've seen that before in some Western, I'm sorry, uh, from Toledo. Uh, so I think it's something that you're, you're learning and being taught there, I think. And uh, to your point, we, we do use those, especially the geopolitical ones. That's kind of a new thing we've done the last couple of years, and it does take 
a senior leader sign off to uh, ensure that there's a mitigation plan uh, in place. Actually, it takes two. You have to get at least two senior leaders to agree. Uh, so I think that that was that was really good. Um, also, sending the GM uh, engineers to Honduras to ensure that the wire harness supplier gets fixed is also something that we would do. So, so that was that was very good. But I think yeah, the one the one main point was around. I don't think we'd go so far as to produce uh, 75 weeks, but I think you were headed definitely in the right right direction, and you were clearly playing in your minds uh, just just how long do we think this thing would take. And by the way, we do not allow um, seats to be driven off the end. I mean, I'm sorry, vehicles to be driven off an assembly line with anything but a seat uh, in there, even if it's a if it's a, a a damaged seat that we can just put in temporarily get it out in the yard and then pull that seat out and re replace it. So you were absolutely right on that one. But very good presentation. Very well done. You shared the whole thing together, even in the in the end. You clearly were all participating in the in the, uh, the twist. And so uh, it was very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Christian Farr. I'm Shandell Norlander. I'm Griffin Dobbs. And I'm Joseph M. And we are the team from Weber State University. So success is grown by surrounding, her, by surrounding yourself with the right relationships. Meet Kevin Coach Donovan, or call, call Coach D, the most winningest coach you've probably never heard of. <laughs> now, who is he, right? He is the head football coach at the University of St. Francis in the NAIA division, has been coaching for over 40 years. Within that 40 years, he's compiled 320 victories and is ninth all-time on the college football coaches and wins. He has won three national championships, two of which have come in the last two years, and is the current head coach, or coach of the year. Now, what is his footprint for success? Coach D has found that having the right relationships with his players has motivated them to go out on the field and win for him, thus finding that success. So today, we, will, we here at GM We'd like to show you having the right relationships with the right suppliers can help you find success in the T1C program. So, here's our agenda. We're going to give a quick overview of the project, the alternatives that were offered, our recommendation we have for the project, go through some analysis that we ran for our recommendation, go through our implementation timeline of when to implement it, how to mitigate risk for it, and then conclude. So, what's happening? In 2019, so next year, GM is going to roll out their new T1 truck program. There's three different models, your high value, your high volume, and your work truck to meet customer demands and needs. Now the goal is to lower those costs and increase profits for GM by working through a tier one supplier, Scooby, or different tier two suppliers. And so we have been asked to work with the T1 seat program on how to lower those costs by working with either Scooby or direct buy suppliers to negotiate terms and also mitigate risk. How are we gonna measure this? our program life cycle savings compared to the current baseline plan. So we have three alternatives for sourcing through Scooby. The first is to have our uh, seats produced in Lordstown, Ohio, shipped to Columbia City, Indiana, and then shipped to Fort Wayne for final production. Alternative number two is to go through a company called DWL, a third party logistics provider. Our seats will still be assembled in Lordstown, Ohio, but they will then be shipped to Yoder, Indiana, for uh, sequencing by DWL and then shipped to Fort Wayne for final production. Our third alternative is to split up our production, our assembly. So alternative three, we have our high volume trucks being assembled in Lordstown, Ohio, then being shipped to Columbia City, Indiana using Scooby as still as our uh, third party, or our logistics. And then our high value and work trucks will then be uh, assembled in Columbia City, oh, uh, Indiana, and then shipped to Fort Wayne, Indiana. So our other options were to direct buy and to place materials on a material index. We took these into perspective, as well as the, the differences in costs and uh, availability for leather and steel. For our recommendation, we chose alternative one, which is starting in Lordstown, Ohio, shipping to Columbia City, Indiana for sequencing, and then off to Fort Wayne. Um, to look into our alternatives, first we had to look factor in several things. The first thing we looked into was our inbound freight costs. 
So to find this cost, we took how many seat sets could fit on a truck, how many trucks were needed annually to fill our production, and um, how many, so this shows the total cost annually. When we take the total cost of an inbound freight, we can compare it to the other alternatives, and then we factor in Scooby's piece cost, the facilities totals, the tooling total, and we get our total over here. So even though alternative two is slightly cheaper, we still decided to go with alternative one because we feel like Scooby um, should still be our sequencer. They have done great with us in the past and we want to continue that relationship with them. We also decided to do several direct buys and we recommend that we put both leather and steel on the material index and we'll discuss that further in our analysis. So with the new GM, relationships matter. And so with our suppliers, we could have that transactional relationship assure availability, have lower cost with low value. But ideally, we want to develop that relationship and involve it to a strategic alliance where we can continue to assure that availability but maximize value co-creation with our suppliers, be more innovative to meet our customers' demands and needs, and then also to have that long-term relationship with them and especially to share risks and rewards with either our Tier 1 supplier or our Tier 2 suppliers. So to be able to do that, we need to know ourselves. So the first analysis that we ran was a SWOT analysis to show our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats here at GM. Um, for the strengths, we found that we have a strong brand portfolio with a lot of cars and trucks to be able to offer to our customers. One of the weaknesses that we found was that we have a limited presence in developing countries. We don't have a strong presence in them to be able to offer our cars there. But an opportunity is our new model releases that we'll be able to tap into those different customer segmentations, meet their demands and needs. And some threats we saw on the horizon is increased competition for GM with these new model releases and also new government regulations that can be come forward. So to help create a more holistic view and rank our suppliers for more of a quantitative uh, view, we created a weighted factor analysis. Some of the factors that we took into account when making this analysis is we have cost, delivery, a relationship, the risk of each supplier, the relationship that we're able to have with them, the innovation that they bring to the table and the quality of their product. So breaking down into risk a little bit more, how risk is a little bit too broad of a category, so we broke it down more into quality, the chance of uh, supply chain disruption, lead time variation, risk cost, and the chance of obsolescence. Each of these risks we broke down, down into the likelihood of a, a glitch happening and the severity if that glitch were to occur. So if we look at quality, we have that likelihood and that severity, which equals 25% of our risk score. And for chomps on the right, for our motor supplier, we rate them a 97 for the likelihood of, um, of a quality issue occurring. Uh, the higher number is good. Okay. It, it needed to line up with our <laughs> weighted factor analysis. So high, high is good. And so with the severity of that event happening at a 90, they are also are a low risk company and good to work with. We put this into a heat map to be able to visualize this a little bit more. Once again, the lower, closer to the origin is lower risk. And so since all of these factors are grouped closer to the origin, we can see that they are a low risk company to be able to work with and it's a good opportunity for us. So coming back to the full weighted factor analysis, we took this, uh, these factors and weighted each of our suppliers for each of the commodities um, on this scale of one through 100. And we have the weights here. But we were concerned about the bias and the unknowns and came up with this weighted factor analysis that we have here. Um, we took a simulation and we ran this at over a thousand times for each supplier. So then we were able to measure which supplier was most, the right choice most often. As we can see, Chomps won this 1,051 different times, creating 1,051 different times, meaning that they are the best supplier to work with and one that we should highly consider as we move forward. And in this case, we did decide to work with Chomps for direct buy. Another factor we had to consider was obviously cost. So before we could find out our total cost for each supplier, we need to see how many parts we needed per vehicle per year. So we, take, we took the index and we found each truck and what it needed for each year. So on the right hand column, you'll see how many parts were needed for each truck annually. 
And then we were able to take the quantity and with the direct buy cost that our suppliers gave us with added logistics, we can find our one year cost. And then added tooling time, we're able to factor the cost over the five years. Do the same with SKUVI and then on the far right again, you can see our cost going direct buy or our savings. As Joseph mentioned earlier, we did decide to go with Chomps Automotive Supply for several reasons. Um, first, let's talk about FIDO. Um, FIDO is located in Korea. We are concerned with sourcing future material due to tensions in the peninsula, and we have long lead times due to shipping over the ocean. So we decided the risk did not outweigh the benefits with FIDO. Second, we have Astro China. Similar situation, we've also experienced delays due to customs, shipping overseas. Again, the risk didn't weigh the outweigh the benefits. So in this case, we did decide to go with Chomps. For our bags, we decided to go with AXL, based in Arizona, a uh, wonderful domestic supplier that we already do business with. Our first option that we have when we were considering this was Shiba. Shiba is based in Japan. They do their manufacturing in Vietnam. This introduces a lot of lead time and potential risk that could possibly shut down our supply chain um, and manufacturing. And that is something that we don't really want to touch as much. We want to eliminate as much risk as possible so that we're able to better pr provide and deliver to our customers. So for the next option, we have B&G. B&G, they deliver to a lot of different manufacturers all over the world. As we are trying to strive to build these strategic alliances with our suppliers, their resources are a little bit too thin for what we are wanting with um, a direct supplier. They, are, they do have the benefit of being domestic, but so does AXL, who is the supplier of choice in this case. They're based in Arizona, they, we work with them already, and they are excited to be able to do more business with us. And so as we move forward, we will be able to save a tremendous amount of money with them and also be able to build a better relationship that will last for our company. Next, we looked at switches. We immediately eliminated chomps from our analysis because their costs were higher than our original costs currently. Next, we looked at SPH. SPH is a company based in the UK, and they've recently been acquired by their parent company, who has a reputation for taking companies, increasing short-term revenues, and flipping them for uh, shareholder revenues. We are looking for a partner who has a little more more in depth and more involved in our relationship and is going to be there for the long term moving forward. So we actually decided not to direct buy any of these um, through any of these suppliers, but to continue to go through Scooby where we already have a relationship and a steady supply. So we decided to uh, remove a lot of those options because of the, the lead time. Lead time can introduce a lot of variability and supply chain glitches have a tremendous impact on the bottom line. As you can see, this is a study done by Nishioma at uh, McKinsey uh, Consulting, sorry. And the left side graph is uh, the share price effect by supply chain position, so where the glitch occurs. When it's happening from our supplier, you can see a 10.9% on average drop in shareholder value overnight. This is a huge impact and following GM's vision statement of being the most valued automotive company in the world, we do not see this as a great fit. We want to remove that variability. And on the right side, you can see the share price effect by glitch type. So part shortages and production downtime, those would be examples of those glitches that could occur due to that longer lead time and sourcing from around the world. So just like Coach D established those strong relationships with his players and found success, we too value our relationship with Scoop. And we want to continue to source with them for the next year with our wiring harnesses. And if it's preferable, we would like to renegotiate costs and be able to lower their costs so we can continue to source with them throughout the full five years. But after we ran our numbers, we decided to go with Final Korea from years two through five. And so considering the companies, we threw SPH out the window is because it would cost more to do business with them and we wouldn't save any money. Next, we looked at Astro Mexico. Um, due to the recent supply chain disruptions of lost shipments or entire trailers going missing, we thought that would be too risky to go with them. So then we looked at Fido Korea and thought that they would be a great company for Fido Honduras because they would be a great company. They're geographically close to our Mexico facility. They recently bought a new manufacturing plant 
and are planning on to recertify that plant in November of this year. And once that recertification process is complete, we will go and consider or go with them in year two to five, showing a base savings of 3.4 million. So next we looked at brackets. We originally wanted to go with only 3D printing option. Unfortunately, due to their tooling time, that does not meet our production needs in time. So we decided to go and purchase through Scooby for the first year, and their current sub supplier is Kony. So what our, we're proposing is you switch to Kony 3D starting on October 30th of 2019. This is when they will have all of their machines up and running and be able to meet our daily uh, needs for production. And with our savings, we will still manage to save $3.2 million based off of switching after the first year, all right, 2019. For our memory seat modules, uh, we've already talked about FIDO and SPH in previous slides, and we decided that they're too risky. Um, so again, we decided to go with CHOMPS. Um, they offer us less risk and higher cost savings. Looking at heaters now, we can see that overall, we don't have much cost savings at all. Fido and Astro, they actually cost more to work with than currently sourcing through Scrooby, our preferred source. The other option that we have is Balto, but with a measly $2,700 save over five years, <coughs> the overhead alone would kick the savings out the window. So for material indexing here, we have our 12-month forecast, and we can see our savings um, for steel per pound and also leather per square yard. So even though it fluctuates a lot and we're not always saving on leather, we recommend that we put both on the material index for several reasons. The first being it aids in our contract negotiation, so it enables us to make longer contracts with less hassle, which is super important when we want to build these relationships with our suppliers like we've discussed. Next, it protects our suppliers' margins in volatile markets, which is also important. Um, we don't want to put our suppliers in a situation where raw materials could rise at a rate that ends up having them sell to us at a loss. Next, we're going to look at our timeline implementation. First, we will finalize our contracts and begin tooling June 6, 2017. Immediately following, we are going to start working on the PPAP process to get all of our processes and materials inspected and uh, certified for pre-production that will start in August of 2017. Following that, we are going to have our start of regular production in July 30th of 2018. In November, we'll have the opportunity to reevaluate our negotiations with Scooby and reevaluate to see on the certification of Fido Honduras. And moving on, in October of 2019, this is when uh, Kony 3D will finally be able to have all their production up to par with their 3D printers. And so at this time, we would like to switch over to using those parts, which much simplifies the production process and simplifies and increases the strength of our seats. And throughout this whole thing, we're going to continue to create value through our relationships with our Tier 1 and our Tier 2 suppliers our supply chain. We also needed to look into how we're going to mitigate risk. So for an example, we'll look at rising costs. Uh, we will have strong contracts put in place that will mitigate that risk. We also put a focus on strong relationships to ensure that we are our supplier's customer of choice. So if anything does happen throughout the supply chain, we're their first choice customer. We're avoiding potential tariffs by near sourcing as well. So what does this look like over a total program savings? The left table on the left represents just sourcing through Scooby and no direct buys or material index. When we go to the right, we can see, uh, breaking it down from when we switch over with Kony 3D, from Kony to Kony 3D, we can have a total program's cost of 530, or excuse me, $5,360,000,000 versus a $5.48 billion original cost. So what does this look in total savings, right? So we have a total program savings over five years of $121 million. Success is grown by surrounding yourself with the right relationships. Just like Coach Donnelly saw or found those relationships in success, we too want to have those success, uh, right relationships with our suppliers. So we want to continue to strengthen and maintain our relationship with Scooby because of their engineering and sequencing operations. However, by going through our direct buyers, it will enable us to get that 
get closer to them, and form these strong relationships where we can meet our goal of lowering costs for our T1 seats, improving profit for GM, thus finding success. But today we were notified <laughs> of oh, I had it. So, um, what's happening right now, right? Scooby has notified us today, April 1st, that the hacker, caught has hacked our memory seat modules. And because they have hacked these, um, they have, because they have hacked these, they have <laughs> caused a disruption in our production systems, which has caused our suppliers to overproduce and expedite these parts by 30% within the last two weeks. They have also discovered that our serial numbers have been corrupted as well. Either being multiplied, missing, or out of sequence, we have corrupted serial numbers, and that may have caused miss or caused us to have corruptions within our seats with producing the last three weeks. So what are some alternatives we have discussed for this hack? Alternative one, open source of solution. There's a lot of brilliant and intellectual people out there that we could have come to us, find the loopholes and back doors to be able to solve this solution for us, but we're unaware of how much it will cost and the time it will take for these individuals to come in and find the solution. So it's too risky for us to go with that alternative, so we are not going with open source. Next, change suppliers to meet production demand as soon as possible. Like we said earlier, we want to have those strategic alliances with our suppliers. So we want to share those risks and share those rewards with each other. So we are going to continue to go with Chomps New York for our memory seat module because they, they have relied on us and we will rely on them in the future and we care about that relationship. So we will go with wipe the system and reinstall from scratch. So we're going to see a lot of scrap. Uh, we do not have traceability in these parts and we cannot risk a supply chain glitch like this affecting the bottom line through uh, not having traceability <coughs> and maybe future incidences due to this problem. So we're going to have a total scrap cost of around $1.9 million. But if we look on the next slide, the cost to shareholders, what will this represent? There is a lot of fluctuations. And as I said with earlier with Kenichioma and in this study, if we are able to um, catch it at the supplier level as we are now, if we confront this and do not let this go by or still use the parts, we can see maybe an impact of around the 10.9%. But moving, if we were to wait and let these go out and continue production as is, we can see that impact go up to 13.6%. And that takes a big toll on our bottom line and what our company or what our shareholders and those people think of our company. So we want to keep that image and help us achieve our vision statement of becoming the most valued car company in the world. So, uh, if we see, we look at this, our total, uh, our stock price, this is an example from 2014 when we had a lot of recalls. If you can see by a few of these points on the graph here and over here, we actually have, those are investigations and with the um, recalls in 2014 that occurred. And that, if we were to catch it in advance and not have those go out, we could save our uh, total uh, shareholder value of over almost $4 billion. Okay, so the steps that we're gonna to take to help implement um, this uh, solution is first, this is what uh, Scooby did for us. They discovered this. They found out, unfortunately, um, through the hackers informing us, but nevertheless, we know now and we can act starting now. The next phase is we're going to isolate the infection. We're going to collect all these parts that have been affected to the best of our ability, going back to uh, the last three weeks of production and also all the shipments that have been coming to us from um, our supplier. And we're going to isolate those, get rid of those, so that those don't get messed up and are mixed up in our production in the future. In phase three, we, have, we want to be able to be um, transparent and create visibility within our company. We don't want to make our shareholders feel like that we're hiding things from them. Because if we lose their trust now, the next time something happens or might happen, they won't trust us. So being open and 
sharing what really happened, but also the possible what we're doing right now to help resolve this. We'll be able to increase trust with our customers and with our stockholders. So phase four, this starting now, we are going to completely wipe <coughs> um, this virus out of existence. Getting rid of these parts, getting rid of um, the software, and the software that our supplier has to start production basically from um, the ground up with a new um, clean system. We're gonna, but if we just do this, then our, these people that put this ransomware on our suppliers <coughs> harbor on their drives, they will just launch it again. So we have to make sure that it's more secure. We have to find the loopholes that they went through to be able to cause this headache for us and take the time now to be able to solve this. And moving on, we're gonna restart production. We're gonna start producing these again. We gotta kick up our production more than, we assumed that we were producing already about 70%, and so we're gonna ask them to kick up to 100% production throughput rate, so that we're able to manage our current production rate and also be able to create parts for the recalls that we have to do so that we're able to get those trucks out back to our um, dealers as soon as possible. And last, we're gonna continually improve our security. We're gonna put security measures in place. We're gonna check our software pieces before they go out to make sure that they're clean of malware, of ransomware, and any other thing that could be used to attack ourselves as a company or our customers. All right, so this graph shows uh, the growth in ransomware from December 2015 to March 2017. So we can see it is a huge problem and it's only going to continue to grow. Uh, in 2017, from companies that were surveyed, 54% of companies reported having been hit by ransomware in 2017. In addition to that, 31 reported they expect to be on the receiving end of such an attack in the near future. So how do we go about mitigating this risk? For one, we talked about our cybersecurity team. They will be responsible for trying to hack our systems to find those loopholes and help us be a more secure company. We're going to continue employee security training so our employees know to look for things like phishing emails and also how to report those to our cybersecurity team to make sure we can get those taken care of. We'll have secure backups to offsite locations. We'll keep software up to date with the latest security patches and we will continue working with trusted vendors and suppliers. Any questions? Well, wow. <laughs> Recalls and also be able to maintain our production standards. So then what would you do in the meantime then? So what we discussed, uh, what we discussed is switching to the work truck because it does not actually require the MSM mm. uh, part. So we would uh, pull demand forward and then start to produce those to keep uh, our, our downtime as little as possible and still uh, use all of our facilities to their capabilities. If I may add, we did the calculation of what it would cost with a week of this disruption and our work in India, roughly $100 million. Mm. We thought that would be better to have that cost compared to billions of dollars that you've seen. For example, we had the GM or Toyota with their disruptions and having to cost all those recalls back and getting the word out to the public. So it's just keeping that in-house, not letting it go out to the public. And costing us $100 million would be a benefit in the long run instead of costing us a billion, over a billion dollars. Okay. I want to do a follow-up point of Pat's points. Do you really believe the sheer effect of uh, a different kind of supply chain problems? Uh, I, the, I've looked at the research and based off of um, Kenichi Oma's study, it, it, it is very convincing. Uh, so I, I believe in the... You think it's just a correlation that happens because it picked out the right factors or you could really define the cause effect in that? So I believe the notice of um, disruptions in the supply chain and it can value is all perception, correct? So if people are seeing a deviation from what they are putting value towards, then I could see a deviation in, or a glitch in the supply chain directly affecting stock price. Okay, so I'm not attacking what your belief is or isn't, but I would have a hard time presenting that 
to an executive level as saying, this is why I'm going to take a certain action. One of, that, your opinion. Okay. Thank you. One of the aspects that we saw that was very uh, positive in this correlation was we brought, during the, that 10.3% drop that we talked about from a glitch in the supply chain, um, to support that argument, when we looked at that graph from 2014 from the recalls, that drop in the share price that happened immediately was almost exactly 10%. Mm -hmm. And so even though if that is just one case study, it is spot on to what Kamichi Omai's uh, research showed and is compelling evidence for sure. Mm -hmm. So if I have a belief, I can prove anything. But let me go on. <laughs> but the seven phase process you went through, I thought that was excellent. Uh, very, very, very good. And uh, you know the reality there is just one of implementation of what you're saying. Great strategy is going to take some muscle to make it work. But great job, thank you. Um, I really enjoyed your uh, your risk analysis. I thought it was really thorough. Could you go back to the the chart that shows the 120 million dollars in savings and just maybe run through what the uh, the high runners to drive that savings are? Sorry, strike with the it's okay. chat. Okay, so we broke it down by um, the type of truck. So this is if we were just continue to source through Scooby completely without any direct buys. Maybe it's the next page where you actually showed 120. Okay, yeah. here we go. So uh, in the brownish gold color, we have the total cost for the uh, width uh, going through Scooby with no direct buys or material indexing. And then with these um, programs, sorry, the green, we have the Fort Wayne total costs, and then um, this is for years two, one through two, and then two, or three through four, or three through five, excuse me. And then the biggest uh, savings, or drivings for the savings was with the airbags, because if we can go back to the airbag slide. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the project is kind of about that. There we go. Okay. Thank you. So um, these are savings based off of our um, year to year from our base price of Scooby with logistics costs. And so $15.6 million over five years is roughly 70, yeah. 70, 75, 80 yeah, 75, eighty yeah. million. Dollars. So that's a big driver of our total savings, as well as uh, going with alternative one um, through that sourcing strategy through Scooby. That one it saved us money based off of the baseline from uh, the current status quo. Okay, thank you. First of all, nice job, by the team. And one point you, you made a number of times that I think is very important is, is relationships matter. And if you think about trucks, and when you look at the opening of the case, I mean, this is the highest volume, highest profit vehicles that, that General Motors uh, makes. And not that other supplier relations aren't important, but if you said, where do I want to have my strongest relationships? Absolutely, in this product line, and especially in the case of a new launch, you know, and so you, you really nailed that one well. The, uh, when you were going through your risk analysis, uh, you, you had applied a weighting to different categories, and then you had the breakdown by supplier where you had almost an, you had an individual rating by supplier. How did you come up with those, those ratings, you know? What did you use to base that on? Let's pull it up really quick. Yeah. So those are your overall, yeah. And then the So these ones right here. Yeah, yeah. So we based off of there wasn't a ton of information yeah. on each case and because of the different names that were used, it's hard to do research mm -hmm. um, for these ones. But we we discussed it as a group, we analyzed um, that short paragraph yeah. that we had yeah. on each supplier yeah. and we based it on their location on their experience with the company, their, how some of them have talked about the relations with other companies and their history. We took all these things into account and did our best to be able to come up with accurate uh, factors 
and wait um, to really judge these companies to the best of our ability. That's, that's excellent because that, that's a difficult thing to do, but it's a very valuable analysis. There are some companies that can provide you some of that type of information on real companies, and obviously this was fictitious, but I really like that approach there to get at that, because it helps you differentiate supplier A from B, beyond just the cost side, because you do want to evaluate the risk. This is a long-term relationship, it's five years, it's tons of vehicles and stuff like that. Uh, the, the last item that I had was around the, I mean, it's funny, it was here. Oh, your, your decision to stay with Chomps. Good job. You know, I think that was important and again, kind of builds on the whole relationship. But, you know, scrubbing the system, figuring out, you know, how do we, how do we recover working with them, I think reinforced your initial point. So, nice job. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Very good. our analysis and findings for the, we are an OPEX team working on the structural seats for the T1 trucks, and now we're back to present our recommendations on the findings. We are gonna go through our, our first conclusions because we want to understand the processes that have been affected. My name is Amy Toscano. I'm Rena Kovalak. I'm Ryan Stewart from Kate Burris. So let's get started. All right, so we're gonna show you our initial agenda. We're gonna tell you about our objectives, our solutions, the processes that we went through in order to reach our conclusions, and we're also going to sweeten the deal with some extra cost benefit savings. So our initial objective was to uphold the GM quality standards as well as making sure that we don't reduce, um, we, making sure we reduce the structural cost was the main project mission. But during that we had to take in some other considerations including making sure we keep the relationship, the strategic relationship with Scooby our tier one supplier as well as making sure that no risks were increased or the quality wasn't decreased. And we kept all these factors in mind when making our decisions. So this is our original proposal. Our team truly believes that this is the best option um, for the case, and we decided to use direct buys for these parts, and we also decided to material index the steel. And with that, we believe that we save about five and a half million dollars. Along with that, we also believe that alternative one is still the best option to assemble seats in Lordstown and sequence them in Columbia City. Looking at the domain process provided, we are going to be going over the analyze and the improve phase, and we're going to be seeing how those affect uh, this project over a five year period. So the first thing we did was create a process map, and we did this so that we could visually see and understand the processes and flows that we'd be working with. So we made the flows that would come from General Motors and in addition to the Scooby flows and how they connected together. It's really important to make sure that we were understanding how we can streamline some work processes, understand the flows, and see if there's any um, some areas for improvement for waste. And in addition, working with the JIT system, it's really important to understand when everything needs to happen to meet the demand. And when working on a project, we determine that there's two major tasks that we need to tackle. And so we will be going over the tier two supplier selection now. So of our supplier criteria, the biggest things that we took into consideration were a supplier score that I'm gonna go into more detail later. Additionally, for our quantitative data, we looked at material unit costs, logistics costs, and tooling costs. There are some other factors that we considered as well. We assumed that the term tooling time meant the weeks it took to procure a part specific tooling for any given supplier. And additionally, we determined from the GM's production schedule that we had 45 weeks. Uh, that was our cap at which we could pursue a direct buy in order to meet our first saleable vehicle date. So we wanted to find a way to compare our qualitative and our quantitative data. So what we did is we pulled all of the supplier info from the case study. We bundled the criteria into three categories, quality, reliability, and reputation. And then we used an analytical hierarchy process to make one-to-one -one comparisons between each criteria. For example, quality versus reliability or quality versus reputation. So we rated these on a scale of nine to negative nine and zero meant that the criteria was equally important. So then it created some weights that you're gonna see on the next slide that actively um, <coughs> reflect how important we thought one criteria was to another. Now we're going to go into our direct buy selection. So our first direct buy was the MSM. And as you see on the slides, we're using the AHP that we have talked about. 
And in the supporting documents, you can see the more specific scores that total the final cost. In the DMAIC process, it's really important that we analyze the current state and then identify the optimal state. So we made sure that we looked at the plan of record, which, which was Fido Korea, and then we will be choosing CHOMPS or recommending CHOMPS as a direct buy selection for the MSM. And these final scores were used on a cost benefit analysis graph, which you can see the X axis uses the supplier score, and then the Y axis uses the total cost in millions, and this total cost included the materials, the logistics, and the tooling costs over the five-year life, lifespan. And when you look at the graph, obviously CHOMS has the highest supplier score as well as the lowest cost, so we believe that that's the most optimal supplier for the MSM. So we use the same selection process when looking at the motor as well. Fido Korea is our plan of record, and Astrodynamics Me Mexico was our optimal decision. But another thing that we took into account when making this decision is that because we established a 45-week cap for our tooling time, while CHOMP seems to be the perceived best pick, they are at 61 weeks for their tooling time. So we determined that Astromex was a more optimal decision because their supplier score is still high, but their price is lower than the plan of record. Our third direct buy was for the bracket, and we are going to go with the Kony 3D for this one because it does have such a high supplier score and it does have one of the lowest costs as you can see on the cost benefit analysis here. And with this, we had to take into consideration that it's also 40% stronger and 20% lighter. So it meets all of our quality standards and really is the most optimal. So we wanted to take a deeper look into the 3D tooling, the printing machines, because while three are validated each week, we still wanted to make sure that the machines allotted each week could meet the demand. So there is a more specific breakdown that includes the entire GM production schedule in your supporting documents. But essentially, we compared the brackets needed per week, which is based off of the GM production schedule for Fort Wayne, cross-referenced with um, the Coney brackets that are produced each week, assuming that they are working seven days a week and are utilizing all of the machines that week. So we did determine that they would be able to meet GM's demand. So in the rubric that I showed, that we showed earlier, um, while we did take risk into account a little bit with our reliability scores, we also wanted to create risks that were pertinent to each specific supplier. So the main thing to point out here is that Astromex and Gidget and Bell are, they do have plants that are based in Mexico. And at the time, because it was 2017 and the United States president did have a stance on being pro-wall and anti-NAFTA, there should be some you know, risk mitigation set in place for any strain that might be happening at the border. Now, looking at the material indexing, um, you can find this on page 13 of your report, and we'll be also looking at page 15 where the totals are. We'll be looking at that a little more intently. Um, you can see here provided that top table is actually just an example of how we figured out the material indexing was provided to us. Um, you can see this bottom table, this is just a four month sample of a two and a half year span in which we were provided uh, the leather index and the seal uh, in dollars of, over uh, metric ton, in which we did have to convert that to per pound. And we were basing this two and a half year span off a 320,000 truck uh, production per year. Uh, now looking at the leather, so uh, again, the top table, this is an example of a, uh, just the first four months. Uh, this bottom table is more of the total, so we're going to be looking at this. Uh, you can see that we have the bench standard rate as well as the front standard rate as well as the, the bench matrix and the front matrix. And uh, you can see them in gray in the first column there. And uh, we took those numbers, those totals, and we multiplied it by the required leather, 12 and a half being the bench and five for the fronts. And we got uh, those $45 million numbers and those $36 million numbers. And we simply just added the uh, the standard rate bench with the standard rate front and the same for the material indexing. And you can see by those 81 million numbers, the top one being the direct buy and the bottom one being the material index, we saved about $665,000 going with the direct buy. Now moving on to the steel, we use the same process, same equations, uh, the same setup here, the top, just, top table just being a four month sample. Um, this one, we actually had the bench a lot uh, cheaper, up to three and a half million dollars cheaper uh, for the material indexing. However, the front frame, due to the uh, change in variable cost, we had the material index end up being uh, over, or about $1 million more than the direct buy. However, since it is the same supplier, we're going to add those two numbers together. You can see in the bottom right corner here, uh, the material indexing is about $2.5 million less than the direct buy would be. So we will be material indexing steel. 
Uh, and now just to reiterate um, and clarify here, we are going with four direct buys for the MSM, the motor, the bracket, and the leather, and we will be material indexing the steel. And uh, you can see on this next table here too, that uh, does come to a rough savings of about five and a half million dollars. So now we're going to go into the second major task, which is the alternative selection as well as some additional considerations, and then we will address the twist. So our team decided to conduct a SWOT analysis for the POR and the three alternatives. I'm going to be focusing mainly here on the strengths and opportunities right now. So if we were able to continue the POR, we would be able to have long-run cost savings, and we'd also keep all the sequence activities in-house. Along with that, we'd also be maintaining a positive relationship with Scooby. <coughs> After the next alternative, you can see here we would, about the same benefits, except we would be fulfilling the JIT requirements, and we would also be, Scooby would be abandoning their peace costs, which is a significant cost. And then in the alternative two, this is where we would contract a third party sequencer known as DWL, and they actually have a very significantly less um, sequencing cost. And then if you go to the third alternative here, this is where we only even have the high volume trucks in Lordstown, produced in Lordstown. And from this, we would all be able to utilize our current capacity, and also we would be having savings from less trips being taken due to the uh, high volume trucks only being in Lordstown. And now Amy will go more in depth with the root cause analysis. So when going through the domain process, we really decided that it was important to do a root cause analysis because it, we wanted to try and predict some of the possible problems that could come from picking one of these alternatives. And this was a great way to um, try and predict these and forecast these so that we can potentially save money for GM as well as some time and resources. So in the POR, POR, POR root cause analysis, there was um, the major problem was the overextending the Columbia City facility, which could lead to production shutdown and supply shortages, all very critical problems that would need to be addressed. In the alternative one, the major cause of the, cause of the problems was the preferred route is a toll road. And this being a toll road, um, we, could, we have, would have to consider inflation as well as um, an increase in logistics costs because that's something out of our control and would need to um, be considered. And alternative two, the main cause was DWL outsourcing to them. We're going to have less visibility as well as the need for more management there. And alternative three, the main cause was assembling at two different plants. This could lead to quality problems as well as not meeting JIT um, requirement times. So now we're going to go into our cost configurations that led us to this proposal. You can find all of the more detailed information on the page 16 of your supporting documents. So here you can see our plan of our record for the um, yearly production. And um, the material cost here total is about $255 million. If you go to the next slide here, this is where we have inserted our direct buys except for the leather because that was based on the forecast. And you can see for annually we're saving about $500,000. And if you scale it to the five-year program length, it's about $2.5 million. And if you go to the next slide here, this is something we can use in our fixed costs. Now, they're basically all the same here, except you can see the difference between the POR and the alternative is that we have tooling costs for each of them. And also, each direct buy came with a certain logistics cost that we have taken account for. So our direct buys also save us about a million dollars in logistics costs. And if you have the next slide, each alternative has also had a certain specific cost based on the scenario. So, for example, in alternative two, where we had to contract DWL as a third-party sequencer, they had a seven and a half million dollar sequencing inflation cost because they had to install a conveyance system to be able to sequence the seats. And then also each cost had a different type of lane rate that had to be calculated, so we added that in there. And you can see here that alternative one does have a lower specific cost. So we did an FMEA for every potential process, excuse me, alternative. And you can find the FMEAs um, in your supporting documents. We have them abbreviated here because we're going to cross-reference them with all of the risk heat maps that we did. So this first risk heat map covers any risk for all processes. So you can see R5 right here. Um, all three potential failures we use in all of the FMEA. So those three, if you can't see back there, are that Scooby wouldn't deliver the seats, Scooby would deliver the seats late, or Scooby would deliver the seats and they would not be up to GM's quality standards. So you can see in this risk heat map that our greatest potential cause would be a delayed tier two production problem, uh, which would cause Scooby to deliver the seats late, um, and a great risk uh, mitigation factor to solve that problem, hopefully, would be to do some supplier scorecards um, and kind of keep track of supplier performance and work with the supplier to maybe try and deliver on time more. Um, and we would especially want to do this if the supplier was a direct buy because we're already putting Scooby at a disadvantage by using them. So for the POR, we have labels R4 and R7. 
So you can see most of the potential cost is here because the Columbia facility is pretty much at max capacity. Um, so we don't really think that this is a very feasible decision, and you can also see that many of the points are more on the red side of the risk heat map. Moving into alternative one, um, just tier two supplier complications delivering to the respective sequencer um, are the potential causes for this one, as well as alternative two, only the sequencer is Yoder, or in Yoder. And then for uh, alternative three, um, the biggest uh, differentiator here is that because we are splitting production between two facilities, it will take more, uh, there's a greater chance of trying to configure, you know, two processes going on at the same time, and we might slip up. Um, and again, just to reiterate and clarify here, it's easy to see. Um, we are going to be going with alternative one, and that is because they are the lowest cost. And uh, we are also going to be going with alternative one because they are the lowest risk, and those were the two biggest factors that made us choose alternative one. So to couple what Ryan said here, if and if we were to choose, if you were to choose the POR over alternative one, you'd be spending about an additional thirteen million dollars. If you were to choose it over alternative three, about sixty-two million dollars. And if you choose alternative two, you're using an additional $76 million, and this is over the five-year program life. So we did take some additional cost savings recommendations into account, and these would start with the supplier term, supplier monitoring initiative, which could help lead to more visibility for GM and Scooby, and this visibility will give us a proactive mindset, which is absolutely necessary when implementing a project this large. And in addition, we were looking into maybe some Kaizen events to help make sure that ensure that thorough monitoring was completed. So in regard to Coney 3D, we are going to be selecting them as a direct buy. And uh, if you look on page 10 of your supporting documents, you'll be able to see uh, the contract they uh, submitted to us was actually for a purchase of 250 3D printers. However, we did the math and we realized that 99 3D printers would suffice the demand for this five-year project. And just in paying for those 3D printers, you'll save $15,000 right there. So GM also has an opportunity to save about $6 million if we were to do a direct buy with BNG Chem for our airbags. But at this time, we did choose Shiba as we want to uphold the adherence that they have with Scooby because Scooby is really important to us and therefore Scooby suppliers are also important to us. But once again, this might be an opportunity for some cost savings down the line if you wanted to trim a little bit more. Next, we looked at the lane capacity rates. There is a requirement of two trucks per lane currently, and we wanted to see if we could have some cost savings by changing that. We looked at a 6-2 lane setup, and that would be six trucks from Lordstown to Columbia City, and then two from Columbia City to Fort Wayne, because it is a shorter time, and they'd be able to make more trips. When we did our analysis, we did see it was an increase in $300,000. So we don't recommend the 6-2 setup, but we would recommend modifying the lane capacity rates to um, meet some of the transit times. Um, so looking at the Gidget and Bell diecast, again, we will be doing them to indexing with them. However, we do want to bring to your attention that they are currently our only steel uh, supplier, and if they are taking care of the K2 models down in Mexico currently. So if there is an increase in demand, we may, we may or they may not be able to uh, keep up with us. So we do believe that these were the best recommendations to uphold GM's quality standards and the launch went out successfully and now we have some problems, so we're going to get into that. So uh, just to go over what the twist is again, uh, we do just want to remind everybody that our T2 MSM supplier was hacked now and their products cannot be put into our seats. Um, and they're also non-reprogrammable, so they may just be waste. Um, Looking in on the bright side of this, no customers have bought this. So there's only dealers and dealerships that have the trucks, so we need to reach out to them and make sure they do not sell this, our trucks to any customers. Um, Especially because safety is so important to us, and we want to make sure that we keep our customers safe. Of course. And um, looking at Scooby in, in this relationship, again, we, of course, want to keep this relationship as strong as we can. However, um, and, uh, so, <laughs> we have a great relationship with Scooby, and we've solved problems with Scooby in the past, so we know that we're going to be able to accomplish this with them. And then uh, I did want to also bring up the, uh, the biggest thing we took into consideration when we were figuring this out was time, just due to the lack of it. <laughs> uh, looking at our process map here, so if you look at the original one, it was all downstream. Um, now that we know that we will be having to recall some of these trucks uh, from the dealerships, we, you do see a bit of uh, reverse logistics here. So 
our objectives for this twist was that we wanted to exercise a time-sensitive decision-making process because as the trucks are we excuse me as the trucks are heading to the dealers we do need to get them back as soon as possible so that we can keep up with GM's truck demand and we also wanted to determine our additional cost because of the compromised parts as well as the logistics cost and we want to initiate an action an immediate action plan right away which we're going to go over as well as implement some long-term uh, consideration so that this does not happen again. So here's our action plan. In this action plan, we need to notify all parties, such as our logistics, and Ryan said earlier, the dealers. But like you said, luckily, no trucks have been purchased by any customers, so we just contact them. We also are going to have to choose an alternative supply, supplier, and then we have a uh, reverse logistic process that we're going to go through later in the slides. So looking back at our cost-benefit analysis for the Module C, um, so we ended up moving towards POR FIDO, and our biggest reason is because they do not have a tooling time, therefore we can get production up right away in order to create um, MSMs that are safe and can go into the seats. And additionally, we do know that while GM feels that there are some risks with uh, the Korean Peninsula and just making sure that parts can get here for our JIT processes, they do have competitive pricing and they've known to be a reliable supplier. So we think they are our best alternative. So we're now going to go into the reverse logistics process, which is absolutely necessary when having to bring back the trucks and make sure that the right parts are put into the seats so we're getting the right quality standards. So this reverse logistics process will be provided and implemented to the T1 trucks that are in transit to the dealers, as well as the trucks that are in the production lines and in the plant as well that haven't been sent out yet. Benefit matrix, root cause you know, analysis, FMEA analysis, additional cost savings summary, reverse logistics, and even at the end you brought in meeting ISO standards. That's really phenomenal, you guys. That's how, I mean, we recognize that you haven't worked in the auto industry and for you to be able to take this case and blend that in and use those tools to, to make your recommendation and justify your recommendations was, was outstanding. So I really applaud how you've done that. I applaud your, your, the education that you're gaining and how you're, you're applying that there. The one question I have for you is why did you decide to stop using the current supplier? <laughs> Simple one, right? Right. So I guess we can kind of modify our answer and say that we're stopping them for the time being because we know that they are um, out in the open um, and they don't know how to get us parts that we know for a fact can be up to quality standards. So this is more like a slight intermission with our supplier just to kind of solve the problem and then uh, we, once we solve this initial crisis we can work with them to figure out the problem or we could even, we have a lot of employees so we could potentially <laughs> send one team to help work with them and understand what's going on and maybe um, how they can bring our system back up while we have another team that's trying to bring all of the trucks back, make sure that they are, are quality standards, have the right MSM part in them and then being shipped out. Um, because, as you could see on the cost-benefit analysis, the price and the quality is pretty different. Um, if you're looking at this red dot versus this blue dot, uh, the supplier score is very high and the price is a lot lower. So I would modify our answer and say that we are not using them just to solve the problem, but we would plan on keeping a good relationship with them and going back to them. And, that, and that's an important part. And the reason I ask that question is, as you go to a new supplier, you introduce a new stream of variation, right? Sure, yeah. And at the same time, this is kind of an external hack. You know, it's not necessarily a breakdown in their manufacturing process or their quality standards or anything like that. So this is a little different than what you typically run into is where a supplier, let's say, has lost containment of their food of their own process, their PFMEA hasn't worked and stuff like that. So that's that's a, a real sensitive one. It's a tough decision because you don't sure. want to destroy Break a relationship, time, right? Yeah. And yeah, I, so. Just to add to that, yeah. I think one of the main reasons that we chose another supplier was because of the they had lost a lot of documents, they weren't really yeah. sure what was so happening. So we just we wanted to make sure that we were getting the parts right away and we from a supplier that we had a relationship yeah. or Scooby had a relationship. Well, Thank you for the question. Thank you. So really nice job. Great analysis. Um, you didn't talk about production in terms of you know uh, during the, dur during the, uh, the, the the trouble uh, segment. Did you have any thoughts about how we were going to continue to run production at the two facilities? We did a a, a little bit. Maybe we didn't uh, clarify too much. We 
we go to the process map. So we knew that there was still going to be activities going on at the body shop and paint shop. Maybe it's because of our, of our lack of knowledge about how you would solve that in, in an automotive setting. But we didn't want to put seats in knowing that there wasn't an MSM part in the seat. Um, so we were going to filter the unfinished goods that went through the body shop and the paint shop into a float area until we got the proper seats back. So there would still be production lines running, just not the one where the seats were being installed, at least for the trucks, because we didn't have quality seats. Especially, especially with the work trucks as well, because the work trucks, uh, they don't even require an MSM piece for either of the front seats, so theirs wouldn't even hold at all, actually. Okay. Hey, my next question is on indexation. Why not leather? Um, well, it's actually very close. Like, uh, I believe it was between, it was about like $300,000, something like that, uh, difference. Um, I believe it's kind of up to the supplier at that point. In that case, we could go either way just because of how close those costs are. It doesn't really affect us. It may build a relationship uh, paying them a little bit more, honestly. Um, in that regard, we were just going with the lowest cost because that is the goal of this mission. However, that could be something we negotiate with this. You know, it's interesting, and I mean, I would say this to all of the universities. It's not always about cost with indexation, right? It's about just risk mitigation back and forth, because you can be on the good side, you can be on the bad side. Sure. But, uh, you know, it's just how you handle it. So, anyway, great job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to follow up uh, Dave's comment, because I've been sitting here, and I like this material indexing. You know, if you look at it, What's the most critical element when you look at a material indexing approach? Well, with material indexing, it is a lot about the relationship, as, uh, as you guys just said. Um, it is a lot of just kind of, it's unknown, so the, the uncertainty, it's a lot of trust between those two. So, uh, obviously with the steel, it was a very large number, so we know what we want to do, maybe they are on that page. Um, again, with that leather, I think that's something we should definitely talk about with our suppliers. Um, and especially since it's already a direct buy, we already have a good deal with them. I think they'd be very welcome to listening. Um, and other than that, I think it's, it's all about just keeping the relationship as strong as we can with them. Okay, the way you keep the relationship, as you're pointing out, would be to share the risk. And so what drives the risk is the choice of the index and the rate of change as it goes on. So from a practical matter, you'd have to be willing to change the index or at a point in time, if it gets out of whack enough, in fact, to do a complete review of what it is you're doing. So the assumption that these cost savings are perfectly real are as good as the index is going to be good over time, reflecting what's going on in the uh, real world. The other point about index I'd make in a practical sense, if in fact you follow an index and it's going on an upward traje trajectory and it's big enough, it drives out any efforts at productivity. So the issue becomes, you want to take the index plus some productivity or what have you. So the only reason I bring this up is each of the groups has accepted the index as provided you, but built into that index. There's a lot of issues that you and the other groups all have to consider. Great job. And uh, I want to build on uh, Bill's comment. He covered everything. The only thing he didn't mention was AHP. Thank you. Hey, great job, team. I was a little worried about you being sequestered in that room for four hours, and uh, I thought maybe your I thought that maybe your energy level would be down, but I, you must have had ten Red Bulls each or something because you had a you had a ton of, ton of energy. So uh, I really applaud that. So very good. I got to poke back at the question Dave asked because it's the one I'm most curious about. So for me, being the supply chain leader of the company, I'm always worried about okay we're going to go down or we're going to have a problem and we've got to determine how long this problem is going to last and so what's the space that I have to cover to, uh, to, to mitigate the problem. So when in your mind did you think that uh, you were going to be able to uh, get a clean break point? So how, how long did you think you were going to be impacted? I'm not sure I understood what your assumption was there, how you came up with what you said. So this is, uh, so again, this is just a two and a half year span that we were given the data for. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are predicting for a five year span. Um, the leather, again, as uh, you guys have been speaking here for with it, um, we, we may want to uh, reconsider that just due to the fact that it is a five year span and the leather could start increasing in price or decreasing in price. It was increasing in price. Yeah. Sorry, I think I missed, I think I, I, I didn't explain that. Uh, uh, back to the twist, yeah. yeah. 
How long once this uh, hacking uh, notification uh, took place did you think you were going to be you know, you're going to be out of business here with, with good parts? Did you give it some thought? I think we might have. You, you thought you thought there was tooling that was automatically immediately available in Korea that could immediately turn production on somehow there and get it quickly, so almost no impact. Is that what you're thinking was? No, we definitely we assumed an impact, and I think that can be shown maybe a little bit in the float that we decided to create mm -hmm. because I know that that could be getting very high, but if we have the capacity for it, I think we're assuming that we'd be able to like keep going with demand, but also hold the trucks there so that when we do finally get the, the processes and everything fixed, we can just easily put them back, back in. Switch on it, okay. Additionally, uh, because Feeda Korea does work directly with Scooby, and uh, they were the plan of record, so Scooby may already be working, uh, with Fido Korea, we were also banking on that maybe they had some extra inventory of MSMs that we mm -hmm. could call them up and say, hey, can you expedite these over just to maybe get some trucks moving? Uh, but you're right, I think we took a lot of time looking at all of the qualitative concerns mm -hmm. and just understanding, you know, the risk steps about how to prevent it in the future and maybe could have taken some more time looking at. Yeah, you did a very nice job with, yep, exactly, and you know, what would you do in the future, how to avoid this problem so it wouldn't happen again. I think those were the exact words that you used, so um, yeah, that was that was very well done. Um, so, nice job, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. What time we got? It's about 4.05. Do you guys, you guys want to talk for a few minutes? Thank you very much. None of the trucks got to any uh, dealerships yet, so we would we would allow the trucks to flow that were already in transit, and then we would immediately put uh, before they even arrived in the dealer a stop sale on these trucks. There's absolutely no way we would want any of these to be allowed to be sold to to anybody. And then uh, anything that was uh, already produced and sitting in the yards, we would we would we would have a stop ship from there. So we want to contain everything as possible at the at the manufacturing facility because we're the people who build it we would be the ones that have the best know-how on how to get this thing uh, switched out. And then we would immediately start on with, uh, and, then, and then obviously, um, what are all the parts in transit? Let's get those all by their lots uh, to, the, to the best extent possible. And if we, uh, it sounds like they lost uh, track of what the lots were and the serial numbers and all that. So basically, anything they had uh, in their whip and uh, that's gone through their system in transit and in our plant, we would just consider that to be quarantined material. We'll worry about that later. If we can get them reflashed, we want to save those parts so we don't lose all that, uh, the money uh, for that. But for the time being, that's going to be something we'll worry about later. Typically though, and then you guys talked a lot about recalls. You have to recall. You don't have to recall anything until it actually gets into the hands of the customer. So at this point, there's no real talk of a recall. And, and we certainly, as long as we've got this thing contained, we wouldn't notify anybody uh, that we've got this problem. We would absolutely keep this problem uh, in-house uh, and, and contained. If, if, if some did get out to customers, clearly we'd be required to report to the government, to all the, the, all the dealers, all the customers, that whole bit. So just to clear up some of that uh, mystery. But I think rather than switching quickly to another supplier, that, that's a huge undertaking that we probably would, we may work a parallel path and say, wow, if everything is lost, uh, at Chomps, that that's who you know the supplier was chosen, which it was by every one of the all five of the groups. Um, we may have a parallel path where we start down the path of FIDO, what could be done. But we would move heaven and earth. We would get our best IT, our best engineers, maybe even a consulting company, whoever we could uh, to to try and really understand the depth of the of the defect uh, and and how to get this uh, virus out of this company and I think a couple of you said we would just clean slate it right I think maybe that was you guys who said that to one right before you maybe clean slate the whole thing to, to get a to, to get a clear reset if we were quite certain uh, that uh, putting a bad uh, MSM into a vehicle and it would not go uh, not impact any other systems any other electrical systems in the truck uh, we would we would probably go ahead and continue to build with those bad parts or without the part and just get them offline and hold them for re retrofit later on to preserve the revenue. So this being a highly uh, profitable truck, that would be our action plan. If this if this were maybe an unprofitable car uh, or even a marginal vehicle, 
uh, from, a, from a profitability standpoint, we probably wouldn't do that. We'd probably just say, rake that off and we'll, we'll, we'll forego those vehicles for a while. But I think that's, I think that's what we would say. And I think, Bill, you, you mentioned it here in this last one that uh, changing a supplier after you've gone through two years of validation and system integration and all kinds of uh, validation builds you're deep into production, changing the supplier uh, midstream is, is, is a nearly impossible thing to do. You've had some cases of this lately. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about how it just uh, kind of looks at it. Really? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Dave took this new job about six months ago. You know, he used to be beautiful blonde hair and uh, six foot two, and now he's 5'10", and all great. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I still but, think I look okay. You look great. You look great. <laughs> So, you know, it's interesting. When did you guys get this case? In, like, sometime in September? Or? Yeah, okay. So, to me, it's amazing that, you know, you've had this case for, let's say, seven weeks. And that you come in here and you can talk our automotive manufacturing supply chain language. And it makes sense to us, you know. And, and I sometimes think it's unfair that we're asking you these questions because we want you to be experts. And I, I do almost think it's unfair. But it amazes me what you guys do. I mean, and I reflect back, and I, I'll say that I said this to all, to all three of us, that when I reflect back at who I was when I was you, you just run circles around me. I mean, it's really amazing, and it's really impressive. Um, you know, the things that we, that the team built into this case are really real in terms of, and this is what we do on an everyday basis. We fight these battles. and. Um, you know, I, I talked about private equity, and I can't remember which team it was that, you know, they shied away from the private equity company. We do not like private equity companies in this business because they, uh, you know, they treat us different than, you know, a mainstream supplier like Denso, right? And so we don't look, we, and we hate risk, and so I always appreciate the risk analysis that was, that was done by the, you know, by the universities. Um, so, you know, what you saw today and what you presented to us was real and uh, it's, you know, what we battle on every day. I've been on three conference calls today on a production issue that I have on this vehicle, you know, on this truck. And so this is real. Um, and so again, you know, I really compliment all of you that, uh, you know, we give you this and our expectations are high and you know what? You meet our expectations. So congratulations to everybody. Being the one uh, non-GM guy, and I have to bring a different perspective. First of all, in looking at students over the past 10 years and five years, and even beyond that, I'd have to reiterate the point. This group is top class, over thousands of people and students that I come in contact with over the years. So it's absolutely outstanding. And so your work has been uh, very, very focused. It's come up with solutions. You can challenge some of the solutions, some of the data, but the degree of analysis and the degree of professionalism presentation you did was outstanding. And so uh, you all need a round of applause for that. <laughs> My other non-GM comment has to do with one of the points that Dave just made. You know, being in the supply chain business, you're always concerned with risk. Well, the other side of that coin is reward. And my only non-GM comment is keep looking for the reward side, whether it's in supplier segmentation, how to get more innovation, or how to get more agility, or how to get more across the whole supply chain. It's not always just looking at the ability to reduce the risk, but also look at the ability to increase the reward to the company. With that, it's been a real pleasure for me being here. And again, thank you. I mean, really good comments, you guys. And uh, I, I would just wrap up, you know, as, as I sat and read the twist and looked at what do I, what do I look for in the analysis and, and what is the process that we use when we run into a, we'll call this a, a spill. And these happen uh, very, very often, maybe not to the magnitude of this particular one, but you think about, you know, we're making, General Motors is making a million and a half trucks, you know, a year right now. Yeah by somewhere in the neighborhood, and maybe a little bit even more now, you know, demand. And you look at the look at the magnitude of the savings. We were just talking about the seat assembly 
you know, we're talking 17 million, 19 million, you know, 21 million of savings. Just looking at the seats and, the, and, the, and some of the components that go in there, it just tells you what the opportunity is by good analysis and, and, and taking good risk, you know, so hopefully it reinforce that. But in the auto industry, it's all itself, and hopefully this case has kind of exposed you to the challenges that, that people working in this industry and manufacturing, you know, you've got a number of our, our, our partners, you know, the Denzos and the Lears and the Riders. We couldn't do this without that partnership. And, you know, I know I reinforced in a couple of the teams, you know, that those relationships. And, and when, when things happen, you have to kind of assess, do I want to destroy that at a time I probably need them more than ever? You know, and so that's why, you know, never, never lose sight of how important your relationships. It's not a subordinate relationship between an OEM and a supplier. It's truly a partnership and the, and the best do that well, you know, and that's, that's where GM is and that's where GM wants to stay. Uh, but when we looked at the, the, the problem, I looked at, first of all, containment. How are we going to contain that? Then how are we going to determine a break point? Because there was no front door on that. There was that estimate of three, but you needed to find that. Because you don't want to go sort stuff you don't need to if you can find where, where it started, where the break point. Uh, how do we restore production? You know, and then what are the, the permanent protect, uh, you know, actions we take to prevent it from happening again? And, and many of the groups really hit that. And that, that's that's kind of the process we go through as quickly as you can because every minute potentially is is thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, uh, you know, and I know many of the teams here today were not in the finals, but talking to a number of the judges this morning, they were just amazed in the quality of the work that all the teams did. So as much as we spent the you know, last four hours with the, the final five, I really want to recognize all of you for, for what you did in your analysis. And thanks for taking the time and hope you had a good time. So. We're breaking, uh, I think we've got to be at the boat, I don't know where Tim is, but I think start uh, yeah, loading around 6 o'clock. It'll be boarding the boat at 6 o'clock. Okay. So All right. Be there, do they have to have tickets or anything this year? Tickets, I think, will be handed out uh, as you board the boat. Okay, so, so they're right down there? Yeah. And does everybody know where the boat is? It's on the river. <laughs>